Good evening. I'm opening the third night of the 216th annual town meeting of Arlington. Tonight we're starting with the town budgets and the capital budgets. Then we'll take up Article 9, which was postponed from last week. And before we begin, I just want to apologize for not announcing last Wednesday that we'd be taking up the budgets tonight. In the future, I'll try to remember to announce upcoming articles, especially when we take them out of sequence like this. The town meeting progress track tracker at arlingtonma.gov slash town meeting progress shows dates of, of future articles when they're expected to be taken up on a particular evening. Since it may have come as a surprise that the budgets are being covered tonight, I relaxed the 48-hour rule in this case and accepted amendments that were submitted over the weekend. In any event, amendments to budgets are very limited in what they can amend. So I don't expect these amendments to be particularly burdensome for the meeting to comprehend. Let me address momentarily the, the top, yes? A point of order, okay. Thank you, Mr. Moderator Carl Wagner, Precinct 15. Point of order. Um, I recently learned from uh, earlier uh, town meeting work, including the, ma the uh, moderator, that the 48-hour rule is supposed to be 48 actual consecutive hours, not uh, business hours. Thank you. Uh, that's not how it's specified in my cover letter to the town meeting packet uh, this year. Thank you. Uh, let me now address the topic of the speaker queue. Being a town meeting member is not a spectator sport. If you want to see greater diversity in speakers and perspectives, then there needs to be greater diversity in the speaker queue for me to recognize. On a related note, if you've grown tired of a debate on a particular topic and you're, and you're wondering why no one's terminated debate yet, that's because no one got in the queue early enough to terminate debate. Plan accordingly. <laughs> and if you decide that debate is more illuminating than you anticipated, you can always pass when it's your turn. On Wednesday this week, we'll take up the special town meeting warrant articles, and after we've dissolved the special town meeting, we'll return to the business of the annual town meeting. We have a packed agenda tonight, so let's get started. Okay, these will, because of the packed agenda, we'll, we'll skip the swearing in during this portion of the meeting, and anyone who needs to be sworn in tonight, you can find uh, the town clerk, uh, Ms. Brazil, uh, in the lobby, uh, during the intermission tonight, and she can do the swearing in there. Uh, Mr. Helmuth? I'm sorry, before we get to Mr. Helmuth, um, apologies, actually, we're going to have a performance of the national anthem tonight by uh, Ms. Rieko Tanaka. Mr. Moderator, good evening. Eric Helmuth, Chair of the Select Board. It is moved that if all the business of the meeting is set forth and the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Wednesday, May 3rd, 2023, at 8 p.m. We have a second. All those in favor, say yes. All those opposed, no. Motion carries. We will, we will adjourn, we, we will uh, reconvene uh, Wednesday at 8 p.m. Again, for the special town meeting. I now call for any announcements or resolutions. Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. 
Not all heroes wear capes. Sometimes they get a proclamation. In a few minutes, I'm going to ask town meeting member Ann LaRoyer to come accept a proclamation, but I'm going to give her a few minutes to recover because she doesn't know this is happening. <laughs> the select board a few minutes ago voted the following. Whereas, Arlington is blessed with many residents who willingly volunteer from their efforts, their time, and their expertise to make important contributions to the well-being and betterment of our community. But there are individuals whose dedication, integrity, and selfless contributions to the public good merit more than quiet thanks. And whereas, one such individual, Anne LaRoyer, deserves a moment in the community spotlight, although she would be among the last to seek it out or expect it. And whereas, Anne's service to Arlington through town meeting, the open space committee, master plan advisory and implementation committees, the historic and cultural resources working group, it's a long list, Millbrook corridor study group, public land management plan working group, and Arlington reservoir committee spans more than two decades. And whereas, Anne has served on Arlington's open space committee since 1999. For the vast majority of that time, she has served as chair, providing a guiding light for four of Arlington's five open space and recreation plans. In addition, Anne has provided guidance on several projects associated with the Millbrook, the Sims redevelopment, and the Arlington High School rebuild. And whereas, there is no open space or major project in Arlington where Anne's influence has not been felt. There are a few words available to properly express our deepest thanks for Anne's selfless dedication to the Open Space Committee's mandate and our admiration for her consistent devo devotion to Arlington and its residents. Now, therefore, let it be resolved that we, the Arlington Select Board, do thank Ann LaRoyer for her many exemplary and irreplaceable contributions which have made Arlington a much more vibrant, verdant, and welcoming community. And be it further resolved that we, the Arlington Select Board, hereby do name this first day of May, 2023, to be Ann LaRoyer Day throughout the town and to ask all residents to pay heed thereto. Ann, you've got about four, three hours left on your day. Um, <laughs> I mean, I said on. Uh, this is really amazing. I, I don't know. I really don't know what to say, actually, but thank you. But, I mean, really, there's so many people in town that have done so many, so much work and for so long, much longer than I have been here in town. So um, I just want to thank everybody else who's such a wonderful volunteer for the town. And we all love Arlington, and I'm, I'm glad that. I can be a part of it, and all of you are a part of it. And you, you all deserve this as much as I do. Thank you. Mr. Fuller, did you have an announcement? Well, it's a tough act to follow. Sandy Pooler, town manager. For those of you who have not spent enough time sitting in these seats, you can come back tomorrow night because we're holding a forum on artificial turf fields here at 7 p.m. Uh, it's co-sponsored by uh, the Conservation Commission and the Parks and Rec Commission. They have some experts on various aspects of issues related to turf fields. And so uh, I think it should be a very informative uh, presentation uh, related to one of the articles that are coming up later in town meeting, but just generally, I think, informative for all of us on the issues around turf fields. Uh, at 7 o'clock here tomorrow night. It will also be broadcast at some point on ACMI, uh, but I will not be on Zoom, so if you want to see it in uh, real time, 
come here. Great, thank you. Do we have any other announcements or resolutions? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Vincent Baudran, Precinct 1. I live near Broadway in East Arlington. My neighbors and I have concerns about safe streets along parts of Broadway and Warren Street and the Riverside Streets. In our neighborhood, we have children walking to school at Thompson Elementary, Gibbs, and Leslie Ellis Schools. We have people driving cars, walking, riding bicycles or wheelchairs taking the bus and patronizing approximately 50 businesses. Our streets are precious and essential public spaces. They should be safe for everyone, however they get around. My neighbors and I have started to identify some areas of concern and some quick actions the town could take to improve safety. We also want to work on a long-term plan to a vision for a safe and prosperous Broadway corridor. We plan to work with everywhere Arlington livable streets and the elected officials and town staff who are responsible for implementing our complete streets policy and the Connect Arlington Sustainable Transportation Plan. We would love your support. If you are interested in learning more, feel free to pick up a flyer at the table at the back for the Broadway Neighbors Coalition or look for the Broadway Neighbors Coalition on Facebook. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you. And we have one more announcement here. What's that? Hi, Summit Chabar, Precinct 2. Um, if you allow me just for a moment to, um, uh, I'd tell you I'm so happy to welcome back our students and chaperones from our sister city of Nagakakio, Japan, um, to our new friends up on the balcony from Nagakakio. Just, just a minute on our relationship with our sister city, Nagakakio. It began back in the 70s. In 1984, we formalized a relationship. And in 2005, we had our first exchange program. So next year, in 2024, we'll mark 20 years of the exchange program and 40 years since our relationship began. And to mark that, the mayor from Nagakakio will be coming here with his delegation. And we will be sending a delegation to uh, Japan in November of next year. So looking forward to that. Outside this hall, actually, you can find a bench that has el emblems of both Arlington and Nagakakio, and it honors honors the late Dick, Dick um, uh, uh, honors of, um, sorry, the late Dick Smith, who was um, a pioneer in helping this program get off the ground. Um, this program was suspended for the last three years because of the pandemic. We're thrilled to have it back. The students are considered goodwill ambassadors to strengthen the friendship between our two communities. And they're here for 10 days during their golden week. Um, there's 16 students up there, along with three chaperones. It's a busy schedule during the week. They're visiting schools, sites in and around Arlington and Boston. They even got a taste of classic April baseball weather. They saw the Sox win in extras this weekend. So they're getting the full taste of Boston. Um, it's been a special experience for host families like mine. Uh, Kenshin, uh, uh, who's been part of our family for last week, and. Um, it's been special for, you know, bringing, bringing his culture to us, for all of, all of the students and chaperones to share, share their culture with ours. It's been amazing. Um, and uh, so to the students, thank you for sharing yourselves with us. To the chaperones, um, uh, Connor, Maki, Hero, thank you for bringing this wonderful group. And to our leader, Joanna Rautenberg, who puts us all together, thank you. It's an amazing experience. Um, I've been asked to pass along this letter and gift from Mayor Kingo Nakahokohi um, to our town manager. He appreciates the hospi hospitality of our town and looks forward to meeting everyone next April. Thank you.
thank you, and w welcome, and thank you for coming all this way. Okay, uh, any other announcements or resolutions? Okay. Good evening. Um, my name is Laura Fuller from Precinct 11. This is just going to be quick. I, um, in addition to town meeting, I work with the Arlington Education Foundation. Um, our second annual 5K road race will be on May 21st. Uh, we're going to have 800 runners, and we're going to sell out this week. So if anybody here is interested in running or knows people that are interested in running, um, it's uh, www.aefma.org backslash events. I also have this poster. You can find me during the break. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Any other announcements or resolutions? Seeing none, let's take a test vote. What do we, let's see what we have tonight. Your answer will not change the agenda for tonight, by the way. Okay, let's show the votes. And it passes. Um, uh, we'll cycle through the screens. Look, look, look for your votes just to verify that it recorded what you thought it did. Okay, that's everyone. All right, uh, I now call for reports of boards and committees. Uh, actually, over here. Oh, uh, yes, sorry, Ms. Deschler first. Uh, Christine Deschler, Chair of the Arlington Finance Committee. I move that Article 3 be removed from the table. We have a second to remove Article 3 from the table. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed? It is unanimous. Article 3 is now before us. Uh, do we have any reports? Mr. Barglow. I'm here to submit the report for the uh, Remote Participation Study Committee. Staff of Arglu, Precinct 10. As I mentioned, I'm here to provide the report of the Remote Partic Participation Study Committee. Microphone. Oh, sorry. Is it? I'm in the right place now? Okay. We were founded at the 2021 town meeting with the intention of improving remote access to in person meetings. And it was felt that this would be necessary at that time because the emergency legislation allowing all remote meetings was expected to expire first in 2022 and then in 2023. To understand the interpersonal, logistical, and technical challenges and opportunities around hybrid meetings, we surveyed the members and the public attendees of the Town of Arlington's boards, commissions, and committees and found that there was a continuing interest in studying the feasibility of hybrid meetings. To learn what would be needed to run a successful hybrid meeting, we proposed and implemented a pilot program for hybrid meetings that we ran from late 2022 until early 2023. The hybrid meeting pilot program was supported in several ways by our committee. We generated documents outlining key decision points to help participating public bodies develop better practices for their own hybrid meetings. These decision points involved items such as contingency plans for technical failures, assigning people to help monitor the remote participants, and other items that may be unique to specific public meetings. 
As part of the pilot program, the town staff identified, equipped, and equipped meeting rooms in the town hall, community center, and public safety building with a variety of video conferencing equipment. And we also generated in-room technology how-to guides to allow meeting members to initiate and run hybrid meetings with little or no involvement from town staff. At the end of this pilot program, the participants in the program were surveyed to understand what worked well and what could be improved. During the pilot program, 11 public bodies considered participation and eight boards, commissions, and committees tested hybrid meetings. The participating pilot pro pro program public bodies were those that primarily carried out their work between members with lower amounts of external public participation in the meetings and could be described as working group or deliberative group bodies. In these working group type meetings, the technology and the materials that we provided um, helped the in-person and remote participants connect well to each other. Additionally, the Arlington Road Development Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals considered and uh, overall eventually opted out of the hybrid pilot program as their meetings are more adjudicative in nature and require greater interactions with the applicants with presentations from architects, engineers, attorneys, and other consultants. These bodies felt that the format of their meetings faced additional technological and logistical challenges that required either a fully remote or fully in-person approach. Overall, the participating pilot program public bodies were mostly able to productively conduct hybrid meetings with the provided hardware and resources with notable challenges covered in the report. It is also clear from the committee's work that while successful hybrid meetings are entirely possible, they are the most challenging remote access, um, option and as such require careful consideration training of training, technology, staffing, and meeting procedures to ensure that a hybrid option is feasible and um, allows equitable participation by those attending on both remote and in person. The town now has several rooms equipped to support hybrid meetings, and the materials we generated are available on the town website to allow public bodies to make key decisions on the running of their own hybrid meetings. Our community anticipates that state law will eventually provide for permanent operation of remote and hybrid public meetings and hopes that its work over the past two years will assist the town in expanding and improving the vital new tools, improving these vital new tools for civic participation in the months and years ahead. Our committee will dissolve at the end of this 2023 town meeting. And I'd like to thank all of the members of the committee for their good natured hard work and diligence providing these resources to the town. We also thank all respondents to our multiple surveys, the members of the public bodies who evaluated and participated in the pilot program, and the town staff who helped support the setting up of rooms with equipment to allow the pilot program to take place. And I'd also like to thank you for receiving this report. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, let's take a vote on that, a quick voice vote. All those in favor of accepting the report of the Remote Participation Study Committee, say yes. Yes. All those opposed? It is unanimous. The report is accepted. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tila? My name is Jeff Thielman. I'm the chair of the Arlington High School Building Committee, a member of town meeting, and um, the report is in the packet. Do I need to give you something? Uh, i give you this. Yeah, you can give me a piece of paper. So I want to give you a brief overview of the high school building project, which was made possible by your vote in 2019. And on behalf of our students and our staff who are using the building now, we thank you for your support. We're building a school designed for 1,755 students at a cost of $290.4 million, with $84.7 million coming from the Massachusetts School Building Authority. And I'm pleased to report that thanks to the leadership of our committee and our project team, the project is on budget. There are four phases to the project. Phase one, the science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, or STEAM wing, opened in February of 2022. Students, staff, and members of the public taking Arlington community education classes are enjoying the new facility. Work on phase two is underway. Last fall, the building committee voted to delay the demolition of Fusco House and the Blue Gym, which were scheduled for demolition this summer. This will allow for full days of academic classes in the fall of 2023, while the construction of the Humanities Wing is completed. The next slide is Phase 2. We will com complete the Humanities Wing, Central Spine, Forum Stairs, Library, Cafeteria, and Courtyard in October of 2023, this October. 
offices for district leadership, a welcome center, community education office space, and the Mananabe Preschool will be ready in December of 2023. Next slide is an aerial view of the project, and the next slide is an exterior view of the humanities wing from Pierce Field. This wing will have 44 classrooms for world language, English language arts, history and social studies, three family and consumer science classrooms, a counseling center, and 1,158 new lockers. The next slide is a shot of the cafeteria, which can seat around 600 people, and the forum stairs, which provide access to the cafeteria and have space where students and staff can gather. The next slide is the library, which will have collaborative workspaces, quiet work areas, resources for independent and leisure reading, and group study rooms. The next slide is a learning courtyard. This is a 10,400 square foot outdoor space for classes, gatherings, breakout space, and an enviral garden. The next slide is Mononomy Preschool. The town's inclusion-based preschool will have a separate and secure entry, interior and exterior play spaces, eight preschool class classrooms, and one high school early childhood education program classroom. The next slide is about phase three. This will begin after the demolition of Fusco House and after phase two is completed. This phase will include the gymnasium, black box theater, and outdoor amphitheater. It is scheduled for completion in December of 2024. The next slide is a view of the gymnasium. The next slide is a view of the outdoor amphitheater. When all of the above is done, we begin phase four, which includes site work, parking, landscaping, athletic fields, lighting, and the connection to the Minuteman Bikeway. This work is scheduled to be completed by September of 2025. Next slide is about public engagement. We held tours in April and September of 2022, and we expect to have tours uh, sometime after the completion of phase two later this fall. The next slide is a list of all of the members of the building committee. We have been working together since 2016, and we're grateful for the opportunity to serve you and the rest of the town. I want to recognize a few members of the committee who are here tonight, including three town meeting members. Amy Spears back there. Amy does all of our communications, which is award-winning across the state. <clears throat> Judson Pierce usually sits in the back. Judson Pierce, there's Judson. And Percy Allison Ampey, a member of town meeting, hardworking chair of our school committee. Outstanding job. I also want to recognize our superintendent, Dr. Elizabeth Holman, who has dove into this project, given us great ideas, great leadership. Sandy Pooler, our town manager, Jim Feeney, Rob Behrens, and Michael Mason, our chief financial officer, who keeps us honest. And I want to remember a guy who passed away a few years ago, Brian Rearig. We think about him every day. He's an inspiration for this project. I miss him terribly. He would have made this speech so much better. Thank you so much for all you do. Thanks for your support, and thanks for your support of our students. Have a good meeting. Okay, you can save the rest of your applause for when the high school is complete. Yes, uh, let's take a vote to accept the uh, high school uh, building report. All those in favor say yes. Yes. All those opposed? It is accepted unanimously. Uh, let's see, the, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Hi, Kirstie Allison Ampey, um, Chair Arlington School Committee and member precinct, town meeting member precinct 13. I move acceptance of the Arlington Public Schools report to town meeting and budget summary. We have a second, we have a second. Uh, all those in favor, say yes. Yes. All those opposed? It's unanimous. Okay, the school committee will speak when the uh, budget comes up uh, later tonight. Um, let's see, are there any other reports uh, that are ready to be received? Seeing none, Ms. Deschler. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Arlington Finance Committee. Mr. Moderator, I move that the recommended votes contained in the respective reports be before the meeting without further motion. Do we have a second? I, I interrupted that vote last week. Uh, I was in error. Apologies, Ms. Deschler. Uh, do we have a second? 
Okay. Uh, all those in favor of uh, the recommended votes contained in the respective reports being before the meeting without further notice. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed? It's unanimous. Mr. Moderator, I move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. We have a second for laying Article 3 upon the table. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed? It is unanimous. Article 3 is now laid upon the table. Um, we are now going to take up Article 37 first. Ms. Deschler. Mr. Moderator, I move that Articles 9, 12, and 24 through 36 be laid upon the table. We have a, we have a second. Um, all those in favor of moving those articles uh, to be laid upon the table so that we are next coming up to Article 37, uh, say yes. yes. All those opposed? It is unanimous. Article 37 is now before us. Mr. Moderator, if I may? Ms. Deschler, yes. Um, before we dive right into the departmental budgets, I'd like um, one uh, moment to clarify one thing in the Ed Burns Enterprise Ed Burns Arena Enterprise Fund, and then I would like uh, to permit Julie Wayman, our budget director, to give a very brief uh, presentation as to how our um, how we budget salaries. Okay. Uh, the one clarification that I would like to make is to the uh, as I said, the Ed Burns Arena Enterprise Fund. That budget is on. Um, the Finance Committee report, page B18. And I'm not <clears throat> increasing or decreasing any of the um, amounts there. All I am doing is clarifying uh, one source of revenue. Um, if you're on page B18, if you look under revenues, you will see reference to a 50000 transfer from other funds. I just want to clarify that the funds that are being used for FY24 are um, from reta um, retained earnings. Um, that's the only clarification I would like to make to that budget. Um, and with that, I think I'd like to turn it over to Julie Wayman. Ms. Wayman. Good evening, Julie Wayman, Budget Director. So I'm just going to be very brief, but I wanted to, uh, after a number of questions from town meeting members, we wanted to highlight for all of you the reason for some of the salary increases that you're seeing in your FinCom report. Next slide, please. So there are going to be a number of reasons for staff salary increases, timing of contract settlements, staff reclassifications, changes in staff, such as hiring someone at a higher step than the prior person filling that position, uh, and possibly along with increasing hours for an existing staff person. Next slide, please. I'm going to highlight for you, just to give a quick illustration, uh, the example of the timing of contract settlements, because this is the one you're going to see across departments, and you're going to see it this fiscal year and in following fiscal years. I'm going to give two examples from your appendix in the FinCom report, B4 and B7. Next slide, please. These are from the Board of Assessors and the Engineering Division of DPW. So these two staff people are both in AFSCME. This union settled in May of 22, so one year ago. So if you look up on the screen, you'll see that these staff people appear to have the same salary in fiscal 21, 22, and 23. The reason for that is because we only once that contract was settled in 22, it was the 22 to 24 contract. So that meant it was covering staff salary increases for fiscals 22, 23, and 24. But because it didn't settle until after uh, we had already indicated the salaries for 22 and 23, you weren't going to see that change until we put together the 24 budget. So in fact, that $8,000 uh, staff salary increase, or about 11% increase, is, is if you're comparing the 24 to 21 budgets or salaries. Next slide, please. This is an actually walking through what their salary would have been for each of those fiscal years had you seen the increase each fiscal year. So you can see that those staff, if we follow the red box, that staff person started off in 21 at 75,639. 
Would you have then seen in fiscal 22 that agreed upon 1.5% increase? Their salary would have gone up to 76,774. In fiscal 23, had you then seen their agreed upon increase of 2% plus a $455 uh, market rate increase, their salary would have gone up to 78,764. This same staff person then for 24, there was a 2% increase agreed upon as well as a $546 market increase. So you would have seen each of those progressive increases as opposed to this one large jump between 24, 21 and 24. I also want to highlight, though, the final increase is that these staff, because they were with us for over 10 years, they were actually granted, moved to step nine. This was a new agreement for AFSCME when they settled the contract a year ago. Next slide, please. So one actually additional thing I want to highlight is that in Article 36, you will see that we do budget for these uh, retroactive payments that we will be making to staff who didn't receive each of those salary increases for the years that you saw up on the screen. So you can see, you can check out uh, Article 36, which will highlight for you the SEIU changes because SEIU just settled. So you'll see, you'll next fiscal year, you will notice that SEIU is going to have a large jump because some of those staff look to have a $0 increase in this year's FinCom report. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Wayman. Uh, so the, let's, let's bring up the, the slide for, that just lists the budgets. And the way this is gonna work for anyone who's not familiar yet is that I will run through, it'll be similar to the consent agenda, but it's better. Um, <laughs> well, I'll run through, I'll, I'll, I'll name off each of the budgets in turn, and anyone who's interested in holding a budget, meaning that you wish to have debate about that budget, um, please rise so, so I can actually like, confirm that it's someone from within the enclosure. Uh, just rise and say hold, um, and I'll take a note of that. And, and then after we're done with the holds, we'll circle back and have a separate debate on each of the held budgets. Uh, there are uh, a couple of amendment, amendments that we'll take up as well when those budgets come up. And then at the, at the end, we will vote, we'll have one vote for the entire budget. And so for each of the separate debates on the separate budgets, there'll be separate termination of debate, for instance, just for that budget. And then we'll move on to the next debate, uh, next budget that was held. Um, okay, so if we bring up that slide. And I apologize in advance, it's a very boring slide with just names of budgets all in the same font size. Next year, I'll consider making it a word cloud, so it'll be a like big like education with a bunch of small words around it. Do we have that slide ready? Yeah, it's in the, it, uh, okay. There we go. It's very anticlimactic. It's not a very exciting slide. Um, okay, so I'm going to run through here, and again, if, if there's a budget that you want to hold, and some, I, I, I received emails in advance of folks who were interested in certain budgets, uh, so I'll, I'll mention that there was a request when I get to those. Um, okay, everyone can see this? Good. Uh, finance committee, select board, uh, budget number three, town manager. There was a request in advance to hold. Budget number four, human resources. Budget number five, information technology. Budget number six, comptroller. Number seven, treasurer collector. Number eight, postage. Number nine, board of assessors. Number 10, 
legal. Hold. Number 11, town clerk. Number 12, board of registrars. Number 13, parking. Number 14, planning and community development. Number 15, redevelopment board. Number 16, zoning board of appeals. Number 17, public works was pre-held. Okay. Uh, number 18, facilities was pre-held. Um, number 19, police services was pre-held. Number 20, fire services pre-held. Number 21, inspections uh, is implicitly held by an amendment. Thank you. Uh, tw 22, education is pre-held. 23, libraries. 24, Health and Human Services is pre-held. 25, Retirement. Hold. Can someone stand just so I can see? Oh. Okay. Okay. Uh, number 26, Insurance. Number 27, Reserve Fund was pre-held. Uh, fund A, Water and Sewer Enterprise Fund. Uh, B, Recreation Enterprise Fund. C, Ed Burns Arena Enterprise Fund. D, Council on Aging Transportation Enterprise Fund. And finally, E, Arlington Youth Counseling Center Enterprise Fund. Okay. Okay, so the first, uh, the first budget that we have held is number three, the town manager budget. Um, uh, Mr. Pooler, do you, you want to introduce this at all before we, and can we bring up the, can we show the speaker queue? So we're going to try something new tonight where uh, when we introduce a debate, uh, we'll bring up the empty speaker queue. So that first, you know, uh, uh, tranche of requests uh, you should see those come in. Is that showing now? Okay. So is, is it open now? Okay. Speaker queue is now open. Mr. 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 Pooler, uh, this is just for this, so we'll have a separate debate and we'll have separate termination of debate unless we run out of speakers for each budget separately. Yep, okay. Mr. Pooler, go ahead. Thank you, Sandy Pooler, town manager. I am really excited to talk about budgets. I love talking about budgets. <laughs> there are 71 of you out there. I just don't understand. I voted no. Um, but I do love budgets. Um, so this is the town manager's budget. Uh, I'm not sure what the questions are, so I'd be happy to answer any, but it does uh, represent the staff in the town manager's office. Uh, there is a little extra money in this budget because it covers uh, the period from July 1st to July 28th at noon when I retire. Um, so you do have to pay me for in FY24, uh, but you're also going to be paying Jim Feeney during that period of time too. Um, other than that, it is pretty much a level services budget. Our expenses haven't changed. And so in that regard, if there are any other particular questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, so the, the pre-hold was by Ms. Friedman. Uh, Ms. Friedman, did you want to speak to this? Uh, can you come to a microphone so everyone can hear? Thank you. Beth Ann Friedman, Precinct 15. And my question really was answered about the um, new position being hired. That's a one-year position that's um, funded by the A... ARPA. And so that position, even though it's a new position, will be disappearing um, when the funds go away. And then if they, we want to retain that position, we need to revoke. Um, to reinstitute it. So thank you and your office for clarifying that for me. Okay. Uh, are there any other requests to speak on the town manager budget? Um, seeing none, let's move on to, thank you, Mr. Kohler. Let's move on to the next budget that was held, 
Uh, and that was number 10, legal. Uh, I believe uh, Mr. Kepline, I believe you held that. Did you want to speak to this? And is the speaker queue open now? Okay, speaker queue is open. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mark Kepline, Precinct 9. I had a couple of questions. Um, I don't know if this is the right place to ask, but I wanted to know what sort of liabilities the town is looking at from legal actions. If um, how many workers' comp claims are in flight, how many uh, for what, what sort of period of time these workers are out. And another question is, um, are you looking at any lawsuits from bad inspections that were done on homes that homeowners later encountered problems with. Uh, Mr. Heim, did you want, do you want to take that question? Doug Heim, Town Council. Thank you for your question, Mr. Kapline. Let me start with the second one because I'll try to see if my uh, Deputy Town Council and Workers' Compensation Benefit Agent can help me with the first one. The second one, I haven't received any notice of any, sorry, I haven't received any notice of any claims with respect to any potential liability with respect to bad inspections. Um, generally speaking, the law is pretty generous to municipalities with respect to discretionary function of that nature. But um, the answer, the straightforward answer is no, I haven't received any notice of claim on that. Thank you. And um, I'll have uh, Deputy Town Council Mike Cunningham, who's also our workers' compensation benefit agent, answer your question with respect to workers' compensation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Cunningham, Deputy Town Council workers' compensation agent. I'll try and respond the best I can. Uh, just for the the room's edification, the workers' compensation budget is including the insurance budget, which is budget number 26. It's a $580,000 line item in that budget. It's not in the legal budget. But uh, yes, we have pending workers' compensation claims. Obviously, we pay, was t the town is self-insured for workers' compensation claims. We pay approximately 60% you know, pursuant to state statute of any uh, worker who's out of work for a period of time. Uh, our weekly indemnity payments typically are running about this time, about $6,600 per week. Does that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, any other speakers on uh, the legal budget? Seeing none, let's move on to uh, number 14, planning and community development. Uh, Mr. Loretti, uh, why don't you start us out? And is the speaker queue open for this debate? Okay. So anyone else who wishes to speak on the planning and community development budget, uh, feel free to request to speak. Mr. Lardy, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. I was looking at the total personnel services for this budget for next year, and it's just shy of $800,000, which seemed a bit rich to me. So I went back and looked at my old uh, town meeting reports. In 2011, it was just over $237,000. Um, now, I realize there's been some inflation over that period, but when you do the adjustment, you find that the increase in 2023 dollars is more than 2.5 times what it was about 13 years ago. So my question, uh, Mr. Moderator, is how does the town uh, justify and rationalize that sort of increase in constant dollars? Uh, is Ms. Ricker here or Mr. Pooler? Do you want to field that question? Sandy Pooler, town manager. I think we justify the Department of Planning and Community Development budget because it provides essential services that the uh, residents of the town ask for. This is one of the best and I think strongest departments we have uh, in the town. They do an enormous amount of work on looking at zoning and planning. They have specialists looking at uh, economic development, transportation. Uh, we have other staff that are directly related to our um, conservation commission. We have another staff person who uh, you heard earlier in town meeting who works on energy issues. Um, overall, uh, 
There are just an enormous num number of issues this department deals with. They service a large number of other committees. And so I would say over the years, town managers recommended budgets to provide the services that it has been clear to me and previous town managers that the town wants. I would note that this year, the increase in the uh, salary side of the budget is, I think, less than 2.5%, less than our overall 2.5% uh, limit. And so I would say uh, this is a budget that uh, is important and not out of proportion to our needs. Thank you. Um, I, I would simply add to that, I, I would think the needs and the demands really weren't any different 13 years ago, yet the town certainly managed to get by on that much smaller budget. Um, I realize that some people may have demands for these increased services, but I, I really have to wonder how widespread it is. And I'm afraid that this type of spending increase simply is not sustainable. And it is the reason this town is always having, uh, have to, having to do property tax overrides. Um, and I would finally note, um, if you compare the, if I, if I did, when I did that exact same comparison for the um, uh, Board of Assessors and the Department of Assessing, this year's budget is 20% less than it was in 2011. So I'll be voting against the budgets overall for not taking separate votes, really to send a message that this type of spending increase cannot be sustained, it, sustained and we really need to have more d discipline in our spending growth in the town. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Loretti. Uh, Ms. LaCourt. Annie LaCourt, Precinct 13. So I have a couple of questions about this budget, which I believe either the chair of the Finance Committee or the town manager could respond to. Um, the first one is that I believe that there's at least one position and possibly several positions that are appearing in this budget now that have been covered for many years by CTBG funding that we did not use to show in this budget. And we are now showing those positions plus their offsets. So the real number for salaries you should be looking at is the taxation total, 635,032. I understand that's still a big jump from the numbers that Chris is quoting. But then if you look down at the nature of some of these positions, this is really how you have to make your judgment here. And perhaps the town manager could explain. I believe that the sustainability manager and the environmental planner were not positions we would have had 13 years ago. And the need for them seems obvious to me. Um, and that I believe actually at least one of those positions are part of a position as our needs have grown has moved from DPW to the planning budget. And I believe that um, we may not have had an economic development coordinator in the past. Another need that I would think would be clear. Ms. Yeah, uh, Mr. Puller, can you explain or confirm or deny <laughs> Ms. LaCourt's <laughs> assertion? Sandy Pooler, town manager, thank you for that excellent question. Uh, yes, uh, first, we do show positions in here that are funded uh, by CDBG. That's a practice we started the last couple of years to be more transparent, and so it inflates the size of the budget, but those are uh, dollars that were always coming from the federal government in the past. We just didn't show them in this budget document. Uh, and yes, the, I remember when we started the sustainability position, uh, it was a new position that uh, we share with the school department. It has helped us get green community grants since the town became a green community um, and has helped us uh, with things like uh, the uh, advanced energy stretch code and many other things uh, that the town has done. And I think you then also asked about uh, the, the environmental planner and the economic development coordinator. Um, I was not here in 2011, so I don't know if those positions were here. However, I would say those are essential positions for us, and if we added them over time, it's because um, we have a tremendous amount of environmental review with uh, building permits that come forward. The Conservation Commission needs help in, in doing those, and our economic development uh, coordinator has done a lot of work to help us um, mm -hmm. with economic development in town, with developing things like Arlington's um, cutting edge within the state, by law that fines 
landlords for having vacant st storefronts in town. Um, so there's just been a lot of things that this department has produced from those positions. Thank you. Um, if the director of planning is present, could we get her thoughts on her budget? Uh, Ms. Ricker, are you here? Can you tell us your thoughts on the budget? Is it a good budget? Is it a bad budget? Is it... <laughs> Thank you, and thanks for your questions. You're I'm welcome. Claire Ricker. I'm the director of planning um, and community develop development. This is my first year in Arlington. I haven't been here a year yet. Um, I can tell you that in the amount of time that I have been here, my staff has brought in more than this amount in grants and other funding mechanisms um, to value of the town. Cost is not necessarily equal to value. I would argue that each of these positions um, does the work and brings in um, value and funds to the town that allows us to do the projects that we need to do. Um, uh, Ms. Ms. LaRoya? Ms. LaCourt. Is right. Um, several of these uh, salaries are offset uh, through the CDBG funding. Um, the work that we do, almost every uh, position in my department um, does work that is related to CDBG projects um, and that is eligible for CDBG funds. Um, so some of these salaries are offset um, by our federal uh, grant. Um, at least half of the sustainability coordinator's um, uh, salary is funded by the schools. Uh, her work is shared uh, between town buildings and school buildings as well. Um, with just general regard to the staffing in this office, this is a community that is involved and very, very knowledgeable about the work of planning um, and the work that my office does. Um, it's important to me that we have the best staff available to you um, for these just in incredible community values that you hold, the plans that you have, um, and the projects that need to be done to get you there. Um, the staff is uh, very talented, very dedicated, um, and certainly, um, in my opinion, um, provides far more value than the overall cost. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. We'll take Mr. Oster next. I don't know her. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Adam Oster, Precinct 20. Um, uh, good just to overlap a little bit, I'm wondering if there's someone here who can characterize what, how much we get in grants from the department, in particular in the last few years, is there a, a typical range? Uh, Ms. Ricker, do you have that information? How much uh, does the planning department pull in in grants, I believe is the question? Claire Ricker, Director of Planning and Community Development. Well, I don't have those exact figures here tonight. Um, I'm happy to report back with those should anybody need that information. I can tell you that since I've been here, we've received um, over $300,000 in transportation um, design funding. Um, we've recently been awarded a million dollar earmark through Representative Clark's office to evaluate um, pathways between the Mystic and the Minuteman Bikeway. Um, we've also received several rounds of grant funding um, related to Electrify Arlington um, and the work that Talia uh, Fox is doing there. Um, those are some that I can list off the top of my heads, but I'm happy to provide a full accounting um, to this body or, or to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I just want to say that I've known for a while that this department is a grants powerhouse. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, one of the things that is pending is uh, funding to redo the, the intersection at Appleson and Mass Ave uh, that's come through that department, and that's millions of dollars. Uh, I really think it would be a false economy um, to, uh, to, to pick away at, at this staff, which is so productive. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Mr. Pillow, did you have an answer on the, the grants from the planning department? Um, if you look at page 102 of the manager's financial plan, which is the pretty budget, bu budget that we, sorry, Sandy Puller, town manager, on 100, page 102 of the financial plan that is on the town's website, there is a list of the grants that uh, the planning department got. Uh, Green communities, 100,000, more EV trucks, 165,000, mass save education grant, 10,000, Peak response, 50,000. Mass Safe Community First Partnership, 20,000. BCR for hydraulic improvements at Mill Brook, 200,000. Shared Streets, 138,000. Mass Works, 307. 
Mass DOT technical assistance, 38,000. Uh, redo, which is an economic development thing that I don't know what it is, but it, they gave us $150,000. <laughs> and uh, MPH technical assistance, MBTA communities, 20,000. Uh, those are, I think, just some of uh, the grants uh, that they're listed in the financial plan on the town website. Great, thank you, Mr. Poole. I'll take Mr. Schleckman next. Paul Schleckman, Precinct 9. I want to second the, uh, the, the thoughts that this is a high value department and every cent that we're spending here uh, is very worthwhile. The one thing I do want to ask, though, is that we've been working very hard to get safety improvements along Chestnut Street. Over three years ago, we had a fatality of one of my neighbors who was crossing the street. And right now, if you're going down Chestnut, you'll see the construction to go and make this a safer place for pedestrians, cyclists, and motorists is taking place. And the senior transportation planner has been a very vital person in making this happen. Unfortunately, that position is now vacant, and I'd like to ask uh, what, what are the plans? Do we have somebody on tap, and when is this position going to be filled? Ms. Ricker. Claire Ricker, Director of uh, Planning and Community Development. Thank you, Mr. Schlickman, for your question. Um, the position has been filled by Mr. John Alessi, formerly of the City of Malden. Um, he started about a week ago. Um, we are going to uh, announce uh, his hiring um, through, the, through the appropriate channels as soon as we can. Um, we wanted to give him a couple weeks to get his feet under him before we you know, sort of announced him uh, to the public and he started to pick up the phone and, and need to answer those questions. So thank you for your question. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Carl Wagner, Precinct 15. Um, I have to say that there is a way that departments, especially this department, can do more and save more money. Uh, in the time that I have been a town meeting member, the Department of Planning and Community Development has increasingly relied upon expensive studies. Some aren't so expensive, but all of those cash outlays are twenty-five, fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars. Sometimes they're for things that the 10 or so staff members should really be able to do for us. And in the past, that's how the department worked in the 90s and 80s. I heartily ask you to support this budget, but to ask the director and the department to refrain from studies and produce work in-house. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, let's take uh, Ms. Mandel next. Uh, Mona Mandel, Precinct 9. Um, first, thank you so much to um, this, um, this, uh, um, this uh, department. Uh, my question is twofold. Um, one of them was, I think Paul brought it up about the Chestnut um, Manor area. And so thank you for letting us know that there'll be a new person in that position. Uh, my other question was, on um, inviting new businesses into the town and what this department is doing in a very concrete manner to address this, especially with an override coming up. So if you could speak to that, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Ms. Ricker, do you want to answer that? I'm Claire Ricker. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development, and thank you so much for your question. Um, we made a hire for the Economic De Development Coordinator uh, position earlier this year. Un unfortunately, uh, DJ Beauregard um, left us to um, seek uh, a, a other, other uh, public service. Um, I, I believe he is, uh, intends to run for office. Um, but while he was here, he was um, quite 
um, adept at uh, talking to new businesses, bringing new, um, you know, about Arlington, bringing new businesses to Arlington. Um, he had a few um, successes. Um, he did talk to folks about the Tango Space in Arlington Center um, and some other vacant storefronts, I think, that are pretty, um, you know, prevalent and the ones that, that folks see the most. Um, it is the, um, it, is, it's, it is my intent and the intent of this department um, to work uh, quite um, um, diligently um, on economic development moving forward and understanding um, that commercial development, retention of commercial space um, is the utmost priority in a town that doesn't have a split um, tax code. Um, that is certainly not a fact that has been lost on me. Um, while we don't have an economic de development coordinator um, in that position at this time, I think the work that DJ did initially at the beginning of the year um, really set the tone and set the stage for bringing more businesses to Arlington, um, talking to um, businesses that are looking to, locate, to relocate. We have heard from Beth Locke um, who is the executive director of the Chamber of Commerce, um, that there are businesses looking to come to Arlington, that it is simply a matter of hooking them up with the right um, property, the right property owner at the right time. This is another crucial hire that I intend to make in the next, you know, 30 to 60 days. The, the listing for the position closed on the 29th, which was yesterday, um, and I'm really looking forward to um, reviewing the candidates and having um, someone um, as good or better um, than DJ in place um, very, very soon. Um, I did if you could stay there. Uh, I did have uh, a question about if you're also um, focused, what kind of business you're trying to bring into Arlington. Is it a uh, small business? Is it business with, from um, a minority uh, owned business, women owned business? So if you could speak uh, a little bit to that, is that something that's part of the job description? Uh, how do you plan to go about it as the director? If you could speak to that, that would be great. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much for this question. I think that there is, um, with regard to Arlington, I think everything is on the table. Um, there are several uh, key development sites that we should be looking at. Um, I think we could do a, a good job um, master planning some of our business um, centers, East Arlington, Arlington Center, and the Heights. We are looking at doing some rezoning um, to facilitate more business in these areas in the fall. Um, in terms of the strategy for, um, you know, bringing in business, retaining business, absolutely, I think we could put some pr um, uh, pr uh, some processes in place um, to support more um, minority and women-owned businesses. I know that was a big um, um, you know, a, a big strategy for our, our, our ARPA funds and our transformative um, growth grants. Um, moving forward, um, we've worked with the Boston Women's Market about coming to Arlington um, and doing a pop-up here. We'd like to have them find, um, you know, perhaps a, a, a more permanent physical space. Um, we've lost a few, um, I think, women-owned businesses. Um, I'm Reparations being one of them, but that's closing soon. Correct, correct. I think that the, there's, a, there's a great opportunity here for, for small business to come in. Our commercial spaces are such that they could really um, – um, they're small enough that the rent won't be so high, so somebody just starting out um, could make a go of it in Arlington right off the bat. It's not necessarily have to be an established business coming in, paying a bunch of rent. We do have some really great little storefronts, I think, that could definitely be populated by smaller businesses and certainly, certainly to support women-owned and minority-owned businesses. Um, absolutely, this is something I'll be talking about with the Economic Development Coordinator um, as, well as, as well as the community. Um. The, the last note, I'm glad you will be involving the community as well because that's a very important part of building consensus within the community as well as attracting, um, you know, a diverse uh, set of people. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Let's take uh, Mr. Jocka next. Daniel Jalcott, Precinct 6, I move to terminate debate on this budget. Okay, we have a second to terminate debate on this budget. Uh, let's try a voice vote, and if that's not clear, we'll go to electronic. Uh, all those in favor of terminating debate on the planning and community development budget, say yes. Yes. All those opposed? Okay, uh, the yeses have it, debate is terminated. Uh, Okay, let's move on to budget 17, public works. Uh, Ms. Friedman, you had pre-held this, and you might want to pull up a seat at the front because you have a number of them in a row. 
uh, Beth Ann Friedman, Precinct 15. And I put a hold on this budget, um, 18, 19, and 20, because of the large percent increases in salaries um, um, for the 20, 24 over previous years. And that was explained very clearly that these increases reflect flat salaries for three years and then um, a negotiated increase that really should, that really covers four years altogether. So um, if you could, unless somebody else has a hold on um, yeah, well, that, that's 17, okay. I, 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 I'll, I'll manage that. You, you, you can, you can just pass it, and uh, and we'll get. Thank to you this. very much, Mr. Thank Moderator. You. Thank you, Ms. Freeman. Uh, Mr. Warden. Um. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, John Warden, Precinct Eight. <clears throat> uh, two questions about. Um, uh, things under the jurisdiction of the Public Works Department. Um, one is, uh, and I don't know to what extent this affects only my neighborhood or the rest of the town, but the uh, leaf collection uh, last fall was kind of, we had leaves sitting in, in our, our, the streets in my neighborhood for three weeks before they were finally gathered up. And of course they were, meanwhile, they're blowing around. And I wonder if something is being done to to, um, I don't know, encourage the company that we hired to do this work to do it in a prompt manner. Now, the last week's leaves were collected four days late. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, if there's any kind of a windstorm or anything, it, uh, it um, you know, those leaves get scattered around and have to be raked up again. Uh, hopefully the leaves are mostly gone, but next we'll have the cuttings of your hedges and whatever. So is they're doing anything to to uh, get, get a more responsive uh, 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 program from the people who are supposed to collect the... Uh, Mr. Rademacher, are you, I believe you're in the corner that I cannot see. Are we leaving any opportunities on the table for dressing leaves? Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll be here all week. Mr. Rademacher. Ouch. Uh, Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Uh, thank you for the question. So last fall was the first fall for a new vendor in town, and um, there were some learning um, uh, <laughs> experiences there. Uh, but in seriousness, the, the contract provides for a certain number of trucks, both in the spring and the fall, and it's very hard to predict exactly the, the amount of waste, yard waste, that is going to be placed on the curb and the trucks uh, frequently get inundated with a um, significant amount of yard waste. So while we would like to be able to pick it up exactly on the day where it's put out or expected to be collected, uh, the contract doesn't necessarily provide for that, but the contractor does um, in strive or does intend to work with us to make it better. Um, we put the priority on trash and recycling and then um, catch up with the leaves. But we will be working with the vendor to try to make it a little bit more seamless moving forward. Thank, thank you. The second question, again, this, I don't know how uh, all the sidewalks of Arlington are, but I'm just, just knowing my, my own street where I walk my dog every night and along, the, that, that's Jason Street, between uh, Mass Avenue and uh, Irving Street, which is only a, basically a block, there are 10 places uh, where uh, a person uh, could trip, fall, fall into a hole or, or, or something. There's a place where the town took down a tree and they left a huge gap uh, in the sidewalk. Um, the, and there, there's another, uh, another place where there's a bunch of tree, uh, I don't know why they are, there's a bunch of actual holes in the sidewalk, some, some of which are quite deep. And if you happen to be walking around last night when we had the rainstorm, there were several m m modest sized lakes and I wonder what, 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 what can be done to, and I'm not talking about replacing sidewalks, but just getting some of these things uh, um, uh, dealt, dealt with so that somebody, some, particularly an elderly person like me, uh, doesn't, uh, you know, does, doesn't fall in a hole. Uh, Mr. Rademacher, can you speak to uh, what the Public Works Department is doing about 
holes in sidewalks, tripping uh, hazards? Thank you, Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Um, thank you for the question. It, it is quite a challenge, the, um, the, and the number of sidewalks that we have to maintain, uh, the mileage of them, and the, the actual funding that we have. Um, we make do with the best we, with the best we can with the funding available. Uh, it's unfortunately quite short. Um, and we, we try to prioritize based on um, population or um, uh, the, 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 the location of these sidewalks to busier neighborhoods. But the reality is, is that we, it's going to take a long time at the current funding that we provided to make a significant dent. Um, any, any idea when you might get to Jason Street? <laughs> I, I do not. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Warden. Ms. Stamps? Hi, everybody. Susan Stamps, Precinct 3. Um, I live in East Arlington, and the, the Broadway Plaza redo last year is just beautiful. Um, Mike, it was really a great job. The only, there's only one issue, which is that it's a heat island. A, very, very hot in the summertime. I know lots of young parents in East Arlington who told me they don't take their children there for an outing in the summertime because it's too hot. There are some tables around with a few umbrellas, um, but um, other cities around the country have shade structures, which are manufactured, big, huge awnings that are on poles and such. And I think that I suggested this during the planning process, and I have sent a letter to the planning department and the town manager and the economic development director who doesn't work for us anymore about this issue. I really hate for us to go into a second summer and have it be way too hot again. And it's especially unfair to the small business owners there, I think. Uh, We're Ms. now um, fully... I'm sorry, if I could just interject. Is this a question about like oh, design, so the question design is or to, planning um, or implementation? To Mr. Rademacher yeah. is by any chance... Are, are there any plans to put shade structures of some kind on the plaza for this summer or some other time? Thank you. Mr. Rademacher, does the Public Works Department have a plan to address the, the heat island? Uh, Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. We do not currently have uh, funding for such a structure. Well, there may be grants or something that the town could get and uh, Maybe some of us can look into that. Thank you. Thank you. I hear the planning department's great at collecting grants. <laughs> um, Mr. Newton? Sanjay Newton, Precinct 10. I move to terminate debate. Okay, we have a second to terminate debate. Uh, let's try a voice vote again. All those in favor of terminating the debate on the public works budget, say yes. yes. All those opposed? It is, the debate is terminated. We're moving on now to facilities, uh, which uh, was held uh, by Ms. Friedman, uh, other, uh, Mr. Wagner, do you care to, okay. Uh, Ms. Thornton, do you have a comment or a point of order or? Oh, okay, you can, you can speak to, okay, we'll, we'll do this old school. I'm looking at raised hands, okay, come on up. No worries. Good evening. My, my name is Barbara Thornton, Precinct 16. I'm here to speak to the facilities budget. And I'd like to give uh, just, I think it's about a, a, a minute and three seconds of preliminary before I ask two questions so you, you get a little bit of the background. Because facilities budget is the, the facilities department is the newest department in Arlington. Uh, it was created in response to the serious maintenance concerns that were periodically erupting into the emergency capital expenditures of the town. In 2012, the select board authorized a maintenance committee 
to prepare a plan of action. And I was one of the people in the room uh, here tonight that was on that committee. I chaired it, I think, in, co-chaired it. In 2015, the select board approved the new facilities department and an architect was hired to run it. There's a, a more detailed information on the back table if you're interested in more. This department started from nothing, uh, just with the, the pain that had been experienced with the overexpenditures and the surprise uh, blow-ups of boilers, etc. The records of the purchase value and lifetime dates of all major town and school properties needed to be recorded in a database that could predict, predict preventative maintenance. The goal was to preserve our capital assets to last their full expected lifetime and to be financially prepared to replace them when predicted. Boilers and roofs may last 20 to 30 years, building envelopes much longer, but only with investment and control. Data needed to be gathered for all town and school capital properties. Policies were created for long-term, for seasonal, and for short-term uh, schedules of repairs and maintenance, including custodial work. In 2014, the total value of their our town's assets, including the building we're in tonight, the schools and, and other uh, municipal and, and uh, school-owned buildings, uh, had a value of $300 million, but it valued the high school at $78 million. So the value today is going to be substantially higher of our assets. Uh, I submitted a report to the select board and town meeting on this new department on May 17, in May of 2017, sorry. The expectation was that the town manager's office was going to provide progress reports, uh, including to the select board and, and hopefully to town meeting on how this brand new department, which we didn't know much how it was going to run, was actually going to run and what it was going to deliver, what it was going to find, was it meeting the goals of the original reason for why it was set up. During that time, the, since it was set up, there have been, I think, believe five department heads, but there has been no further report that I know of on the status of the department's accomplishments in regard to this. So I have Two questions. The, the primary question is, will, town, will the town manager's office be able to provide an annual comprehensive uh, report to this body for at least five years so we can all get acquainted with what it does, what it should do, and uh, provide some feedback? These are our asset, our primary assets. And, the, and I say for five years because I don't see this as an ongoing responsibility. The second question is, a, as I look at the budget, I see it's primarily focused on custodial. And custodial is very important, but it is not as, the, that is in the long-term, medium, seasonal term, and short-term goals that the original department was set up to follow. Most of the budget, it looks like, focuses on short-term custodial and is still missing the pieces, or I fear is missing the pieces for the longer term uh, preservation of our, of, our depart of our buildings. So two questions. Yep. Uh, Mr. Puller, uh, do you have an answer to those questions? Is there a plan to have, a, like for the next five years, I believe have a facilities report, a comprehensive report? Uh, Sandy Puller, town manager. Um, first, I'd like to uh, echo what Barbara Thornton said about her role in having set up this department. She is a key person to recognize the need for a facilities department. Uh, it was a true lack in the town at the time, and uh, so I think we should all give her credit for the work she did to do that. Um, in terms of reports, we do report on uh, what the facilities has done. It's, there are reports in the um, annual report that just was published. There is also a report within the, um, the financial plan that I mentioned before, uh, talking about planning, uh, where we talk about uh, goals, objectives, and accomplishments. Furthermore, uh, it has been the case for the last few years that the facilities director has met regularly with the capital planning committee to talk about what the 
Facilities Department is doing on capital and inform that committee about it. And finally, I would just say from a budget point of view, um, most of the additions to this department have really been in the preventive maintenance area. If you look at the department's budget over the last five years, there's been a substantial amount of growth, uh, both in terms of preventive maintenance and for hiring engineers or other outside people to come in and help the facilities department director look at uh, planning for and maintaining buildings. And I would ask Rob Barrett, if he's here, if he could just speak a little bit to that um, and um, about what your department is doing. It'll have to be a very little bit. We only have about 40 seconds. Uh, Rob Barrett, Director of Facilities. Uh, as far as reporting goes, uh, we have um, initiated a, a couple of facil facility condition assessments, which I, I think maybe is where you're trying to get to. Uh, these facility condition assessments can, you know, uh, predict um, where we are uh, with deficits and maintenance. Um, we've done that for a couple of schools now, and uh, the expectation would be that we would uh, we would roll that out to other buildings. Is the database complete for all the uh, assets? Uh, the database is complete for all the assets. We have rolled out um, originally. School dude. Mm -hmm. uh, originally uh, yeah. rolled out school dude, um, and uh, we've upgraded that to uh, asset essentials, and that database is being uh, being utilized. Great. Okay. Thank you very time much. Time is up. Thank, thank you, Ms. Thornton. Uh, let's see, we have no one else in the speaker queue. So debate for the facilities budget is finished. Uh, it is 9.29. Let's take a 10-minute break, and this time I mean it, 10 minutes. Okay, okay everyone. Okay, we're going to start up now with the police budgets. So if everyone can find their seats, please. Okay, and can we confirm over here that the speaker, th this is a new speaker queue that we started? It's not. Okay, so we'll, let's, let's reset the speaker queue. Okay, so let's start back up. Ms. Friedman, did you want to make a comment on the police? We're doing the police services budget now. Yes. Pass. Okay. Uh, let's see. Next. Okay, the speaker queue is bouncing around. Uh, Ms. Manfield, Mansfield. Is Ms. Mansfield here? Oh, is there a, there should be a, a wireless microphone up there. Yeah. Yeah. Please try not to trip on the stairs. Yeah. Oh, hello. Does it work? Hello? Yes, okay. we can hear you. Sorry. Thank Go you. Go ahead. Um, my question was about the social work. Oh, I'm sorry. Name and precinct, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Jennifer Mansfield, Precinct 9. Um, I'm wondering about the social work um, budget, just an explanation. It looks really low, and I don't know if there's another one of those explanations that makes a lot of sense or if it's just very terrible pay. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Chief Flaherty, are you here? Hi, Julie Flaherty, Chief of Police. Thank you for that question. Um, so we have a social worker position. The position is specifically a homeless outreach worker, and the police department shares this position with Health and Human Services. So the police department pays 75% of the salary, and the 25 um, remaining percent of the salary is out of Health and Human Services budget. Great. Is there anything else? Okay, thank you. That's it. Great, thank you. 
I will take Mr. Jameson next. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. I have two questions. Um, I wanted to follow up on my questions last year about police details and the fulfillment rate. Is your question, what is the fulfillment rate? What is the fulfillment rate? So if, you know, if 100, yeah. 100 details are requested, what percentage of uh, details are we filling? Chief Flaherty, what's the fulfillment rate of the police details? Do you have details on that? Julie Flaherty, Chief of Police, and uh, I think my response is that depends. It depends on the time of year, um, the weather, whether or not the asphalt plants are open, whether or not um, there's extensive road work being done. On average, we would fill um, 80 to 100 percent of our details. During the winter, we fill pretty close to 100 percent of our details, um, so much so that our offices go to other communities to assist um, with, with their road projects and, and details. In the summertime, um, not so much. We do have four additional special police officers that we brought on last year who are helping to fill that gap. Um, but I, I would say between 80 to 100 percent. Excellent. I do have one more. So, But um, I, the reason this is important from my perspective not, is the fact that if we want new growth, which we talked about earlier in the meeting, and people to be able to build things and find Arlington be a um, good place to do projects on residential and commercial uh, properties. We want to make sure that they can um, uh, get stuff done when they need a detail that a detail is available. Um, uh, just a, um, something I heard as a, as a um, anecdotal story was the citizen. Oh, that, oh that's, sorry, that's not your problem. Um, <laughs> um, so the, my other question is, I was I was happy to see in the, the financial plan, the manager's big financial plan and um, uh, this year that and maybe you've listed it in previously that you list the number of FID, uh, firearms IDs, and license to carries as a total number in the town. And is that a number, is that the total number for each year or is that the number that were reviewed each year in the report? Um, so the total number of new and renewed firearms licenses for 2022 was 220. Nine and townwide, we have approximately 1,300 residents who have license to carry. Yeah, so I've always wanted to know what you know. We have um, excellent um, gun regulations in this state. We have the lowest um, gun fatality rate in the country, and we of course have our wonderful police department that takes good care of us. And I always wanted to know what the what the quote risk quotient was. Um, and this is good. This is good news in my mind in that only 1,300 permits. Um, exist of both types, and would you um, guess that most of those are the lower FID category? I would guess that most of them are Class A licensed to carry. Oh, okay, weapons. okay, thank you. But it's, I just always wanted to know, you know, it's, we don't have a big gun culture, I don't think, in Arlington, but I just wanted to know what the risk was, and I thank you for putting that in the report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take uh, Ms. Carlton Keeson next. Hi, Betsy Carlton Giesen, Precinct 9. Uh, I wanted to follow up on the question about the social worker, uh, and so that is currently focused on homeless outreach. Is there any plan to include social work services to also cover mental health and substance abuse calls? Uh, Chief Flaherty, is there any plan for the social worker to cover those areas? Julie Flaherty, Chief of Police. So we actually have two social workers. We have our um, Arlington Police Department clinician who is embedded within the police department, and then we have the second position that I mentioned that we shared with Health and Human Services. Um, our clinician um, is embedded in the police department and co-responds co to calls with police officers um, and works with people who are in behavioral health crises and, um, and suffering from substance abuse issues. We also have a recovery coach that works part-time who works with people who are in the recovery journey, and that person is also assigned to the police department. Excellent. Do you find that the uh, that capacity within the department is sufficient, or 
Uh, do you ever find that having one clinician is, is stretched a little bit across the size of the department? So I think that person is definitely stretched. We've been working um, with DMH to try to get funds for a second clinician and um, you know, our clinician right now works days, Monday through Friday, and it would be great to have somebody off, on off hours and weekends to, to fill in the gaps. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and I have one other question. Okay. Um, in uh, 2021, fiscal year 22, we had voted for uh, body-worn cameras, and I wondered if there was a policy yet in place or if they were actually deployed and being used. So we do not have a policy in place yet, and we have not deployed them yet. Um, the town is in negotiations with the unions, and we mm -hmm. um, hope to pursue that plan to implement them soon. Okay. Is there an estimated timeline? Because it's been three, it's been three years. years. I, I don't have an estimated timeline. Okay. But could you speak a little to the process of how that's being developed and why it's taking so long? Um, I can defer to, to the town manager on that. Mr. Uh, um, Mr. Puller, yes. Sandy Puller, town manager. Uh, we're currently in arbitration with the patrol union, and we haven't started negotiations with the senior officers union, the ranking officers union. They're sort of waiting to see what patrol does. Uh, so this has been an issue that we've had going on in conversations with the patrol union, but until we get through that arbitration, Everything about our relations with that union is now in limbo until we get a decision. So we would love to move forward on this. We're just a little stuck. Got it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take Mr. Miller next. Is, is Mr. Miller here? Matt Miller, yes. No worries. Uh, Mr. Wagner? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Wagner, Precinct 15. I move to terminate debate on the article. Okay, we have a second to, uh, to motion to terminate debate. Let's try this by voice. Uh, all those in favor of terminating debate on the police budget, say yes. yes. All those opposed, say no. no. The, uh, the, the budget debate is terminated. We're moving on to budget number 20, fire services. Um, uh, let's, uh, let's reset the speaker queue. Okay. We're, we're good with the speaker queue? Okay. Does anyone wish to speak to uh, the fire services budget? Uh, Mr. Badick? Pass? Okay. Okay, last chance. Seeing no one else, we're moving on now to uh, inspections. Uh, budget number 21. And uh, let's see, uh, one second, before we take speakers from the queue, and the, and the queue is reset here, right? Um, so before we take speakers from the queue, um, uh, Mr. Kepline has an amendment that affects both the inspections budget number 21 and health and human services number 24. And they need to be spoken, uh, they need to be discussed together uh, because the amendment links them and the reason is that we cannot increase, uh, by law, the inspections bu budget, which would, uh, which would run afoul of the legal requirement of having a bu bu uh, balanced budget for the town, um, and, uh, unless we consider both the increase to the inspections budget and the decrease, the corresponding decrease in the health and human services budget together. So we're actually going to discuss both inspections and health and human services together and leading off that uh, discussion, that debate, uh, Mr. Kepline, would you please introduce your, your amendment? And can we, can we bring that up on the, and I, uh, uh, yeah, feel free to uh, uh, request to speak at this point. The queue is open and we'll bring up the, and this should be the amendment text. Mr. Kepline, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mark Kepline, Precinct 9. I submitted this uh, budget amendment um, and the motivation was primarily to make an initial start on trying to cut back spending in order to hopefully delay a, a budget, an override, a property tax override, which hurts the diversity in our town. As that people can't afford to remain in Arlington, they move away. And we lose 
you know, from elders who leave, we, leave, we lose a lot of institutional knowledge um, and legacy information. Um, and then lower income people who can't afford the resulting rent increases, they have to leave also. So I wanted to um, suggest to delete the diversity and inclusion and equity position within the human services uh, department and then transfer some of the savings over to um, the inspections department which is recovering from a difficult period under the previous director. Um, can we, I'm sorry, can we zoom in uh, on the display, uh, the, what's that? You cannot, okay, okay, everyone squint then. Sorry, Mr. Kepline, go ahead. All right, hopefully you can pick up printed versions or read your email. Um, so, it, there's kind of a uh, identity issue and in, in cultural s situation here in Arlington. I mean, we're a town, and uh, the, the added spending is more in line with that of a city. Uh, we're limited by town property tax income and have no split commercial, no split tax rate. So we're, we're quite bounded, and we should act more like a town as, on the spending side. And so getting rid of a DEI position is part of that, so that um, we're much more homogeneous in makeup than a lot of urban cities um, where the population doesn't, is not well reflected in the town's employees or the, or the, or the uh, police employees or the school employees. So uh, I think those places, cities, um, they could use the DEI uh, department, but here in Arlington, I think it's a less urgent need, and so in order to stave off a property tax increase, that we should start looking at ways to save money. Uh, so the language allowed for such a motion to cut a budget and transfer monies is is quite strict. So I can only state a, a reduction for the whole department, and it's up to the department head and the town manager to decide how they would make those cuts. And same thing if transferring f to the inspections department, the inspection department is needed for future growth of businesses and redevelopment to do inspections and make sure that these new spaces are safe and uh, not going to prevent uh, collapse or fire hazard, etc. Um, so uh, the reduction of both the DI uh, director and the, um, the inclusion coordinator, which is an ARPA funded position. So I, I recommended transferring that position money to inspections along with some expense cash. Right, and, and just to be clear, uh, Mr. Kepline and I discussed this ahead of time when he submitted his amendment, uh, just so it's clear to everyone else, the, the granularity at which the amendment can be made uh, for, a, um, for a town budget in this case under this article is the granularity of one of the top level budgets listed in Appendix B of the Finance Committee report. And so although Mr. Kepline's desire may be to remove one particular uh, um, position and move that move that what would have been the salary for that position to another department. Uh, town meeting doesn't have the authority to make such a fine grained change. We can only change the total budgets, and then it's up to the directors uh, of those department those department heads to determine what to do. If town meeting passes an amendment that cuts a budget, for instance, uh, or increases a budget, it's up to the department head to decide what to do with that lesser or greater amount of money for their budget. Um, and so, Mr. Kepline, if you want to, if we can scroll up to the, the vote language on the motion, uh, if you want to kind of uh, speak to that and make that motion, uh, we can then look for a second. Okay. Um, yeah, one other thing, as far as the department heads, they're aware of contracts, employment contracts, so, and we have no visibility into that, so you can't arbitrarily cut a position that, you know, is contracted out still for years. So the, I'll read it. I make the following amendment to the Town of Arlington Mass Health and Human Services 
and inspections budgets, reduced section health and human services appropriation by $184,624, amending the taxation total from $1.634 million to $1.568 million. Um, so this is the taxation total. So the appropriation total would also include grants. So this does not, and we're supposed to specify the taxation total. And increased funding by 95,962 um, to the inspections department. Um, and just so there is like a leftover here, which would remain unallocated. And so therefore the, the total town budget uh, that we'd be voting on at the end of all, of all the budget debates would be lesser by, I believe, that $88,662. Is that right, Mr. Kepler? That's right. So that would free up money for, for uh, other uses. Okay, so we have a motion before us. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a second. Uh, this motion is now pending on top of the main motion, which is essentially the, the vote language from Appendix B from the Finance Committee report. Um, so after the debate on this, uh, let me, you can finish your time. Oh, no, any more speakers? Okay. Um, I'm essentially done. Thank you Okay. for your time. All right. Thank you, Mr. Kepler. Um, so just have, a, uh, I'll take Mr. Pooler next to speak to this, but before we take Mr. Pooler, just want to explain that, so we'll have debate on these two budgets, the uh, Health and Human Services budget, number 24, and the Inspections budget, number 21, um, and uh, and then we, we'll vote on Mr. Kepline's amendment after debate on these two budgets. Mr. Pooler, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Sandy Pooler, Town Manager. As you might expect, I would urge you to vote against this amendment. I think reading Mr. Kepline's comment speaks for itself, but I would like to just point out a couple of um, a couple of phrases that I thought were indicative of the motivation of this amendment. He says, DEI is just one of those city services. Massachusetts has survived 400 years of immigration without diversity, equity, and inclusion departments, and will surely survive, them with, survive without them now. We'd also like to point out where he says, um, town and school employees look more like its residents than elsewhere, with the exception of gender inequality in primary schools. Too few male teachers depriving boys of male teachers as role models. We have one of the strongest DEI departments in the state. We were one of the first communities to hire a DEI director. Even before uh, the George Floyd murders, uh, Jill Harvey came on. She has helped other cities and towns across Massachusetts set up their DEI departments. I won't go through the full list of all the wonderful things that that department has done. I will just say that it is my honor and pleasure to work with her. She is one of the most fair-minded, balanced, intelligent, and hardworking departments we, had, departments we have. Um, inspections does not need this money, um, particularly if it's pulling the rug out from DEI. I strongly, I don't think I need to strongly urge you because I'm sure you're going to vote against this amendment and I hope you do, thank you very much. Okay, well, let's, let's hold our applause. Okay. Um, let's, uh, let's take, uh, Ms. Deschler, do you want to speak to this? Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. Um, just a few points. Uh, first of all, uh, it is true that the Finance Committee does not micromanage uh, budgets, nor can town meeting. You can approve the budget or not, but you cannot order um, uh, one department to get rid of personnel or to force another department like inspections to do what Mr. Kapline wants him, inspection, and special services to do. Uh, the other thing I'd like to point out is um, um, the vote. Um, and, uh, in his comments um, to this amended uh, motion, um, Mr. Kapline says that um, the DEI budget received the most no vote votes in the Finance Committee of any department. Um, it is true that four people voted against it. 
Uh, four people also voted against uh, field maintenance expenses, but I'd like to point out that this budget was overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly approved by a vote of 12 to 4 by the Finance Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take uh, Mr. Prokosh uh, out of order since I, I don't think we've heard much from him. Mr. Prokosh? Pass? Um, uh, Ms., Mr. Newton? Sanjay Newton, Precinct 10. I move to terminate debate. Okay, we have a second to terminate debate. Let's try this by voice vote. All those in favor of terminating, de terminating debate on the inspections budget and health and human services budget say yes. Yes! All those opposed? No. Let's go to a, a regular vote, an electronic vote. If you're in favor of terminating debate on the Health and Human Services budget and the uh, inspections budget, vote yes. If you want to continue to debate on those budgets, vote no. Okay, let's close voting. And it passes. And this is doing a two-thirds calculation, correct? Okay. And that is a two-thirds vote. Debate is terminated on those budgets. Okay, so that brings us to the education budget, number 22. Um, Dr. Allison Ampey? Uh, hold on. Uh, Mr. Fosco, you have a point of order? Oh, I'm sorry. You're right about terminating debate, but we didn't vote on the amendment. Thank you. Thank you for that. Let's bring up a vote now on, on Mr. Kepline's amendment. Oh, we'll do a regular vote. Oh, I'm sorry. This, uh, the, we're voting on, I'm sorry, whether to uh, adopt Mr. Kepline's amendment to transfer, I'm sorry, did not have that ready, um, uh, to reduce the Health and Human Services uh, funding by 184, roughly $184,000, uh, increase the inspections budget funding by roughly $96,000, and having roughly $87,000 uh, lesser in the overall town budgets. If you're in favor of that amendment, vote yes. If you want to leave the main motion unamended, uh, as shown in Appendix B of the FinCom report, uh, vote two for now. Okay, let's uh, close voting. The uh, amendment fails, uh, eight in the affirmative, 199 in the negative, and four abstentions. Okay, so the main motion is not amended. We're now moving on to the education budget, Dr. Allison Ampey. And can we uh, clear the speaker queue, please? Thank you. Thank you. Kirsten Allison, chair of the school committee, and a town meeting member from Precinct 13. I'd like to, I'd like to request that we have 10 minutes to speak. Okay, we have a request from, uh, do we have a second? second. Okay, we have a request of, uh, for 10 minutes to speak. Um, all those in favor of extending the speaking time to 10 minutes, say yes. Yes. All those opposed? The yeses have it. Um, okay. 10 minutes. Okay, hi again. So I'm the current chair of the Arlington School Committee. Oh, Mike. sorry. It's, okay, this is different than our mics in the school committee room. Um, I'm the current chair of the school committee and I'm very proud to present town meeting with the Arlington Public Schools report to town meeting, which includes the Arlington School Committee's approved budget for fiscal 24. 
In this report, I've written a letter to you, town meeting members, about our strategic plan with some examples of how we hope things will change for our students in the years to come. I'm not sure if current town moderator Greg Christiana is as adamant that we not read material already handed out, as was former town moderator John Leone. But just to be careful, I will not read my letter. But you can. You can find it on page 8. And I hope you'll take a look at it and um, read it and have it if you have any questions for us. And now I'd like to introduce our superintendent, Dr. Elizabeth Hellman, who'll be giving our budget presentation. Also joining us tonight is our assistant superintendent for finance and operations, Mr. Michael Mason. Thank you. Do we have slides? Yeah, can we bring up Dr. Hellman's slides? Oh yeah, and Dr. Hellman, by the way, you can, uh, you can see the same presentation over there oh, on the side if that's fantastic. easier. Fantastic, thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and good evening, town meeting members. It is a pleasure to be here tonight to present the school committee's proposed FY24 budget to town meeting. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Homan, and I'm the very proud superintendent of the Arlington Public Schools. Next slide, please. Though there are many to thank for the work that went into our budget planning this year, I want to begin by thanking the amazing students of the Arlington Public Schools whose artwork adorns the cover of this year's budget book, and you can see that if you have a copy. Our students teach us every day about what they need to learn and to thrive in our schools, and I would also like to thank the school committee for their daily support of our schools and the finance committee for their support of this budget. I'm going to begin tonight by sharing the work we've been doing this year to develop a community-led, student-focused strategic plan for the Arlington Public Schools. The strategic plan was developed throughout this past year and unanimously adopted by the school committee on March 30th of 2023. The plan includes a vision and mission statement, four strategic priorities, and three initiatives to support each of those four priorities. And some of you in this room were members of the committees that helped to develop this work. Keep going. I forgot to tell you next slide. Right there. Perfect. Thank you. Our new vision and mission were developed by over 60 stakeholders last spring and are the foundation of this plan. The vision statement in particular prioritizes the creation of environments that support belonging, equity, and empowerment because we know we can hold students to high standards, growth, and that they will challenge themselves and each other and experience connection, joy, when they are learning in supportive spaces with adequate resources and supports. Next slide, please. The plan includes four priority areas, which are listed here. Beneath each priority are three initiatives designed to accelerate our work in these four key areas, teaching and learning, professional development, operations and finance, and collaborations with the full Arlington community. Next slide, please. I share our work on the strategic plan because this year's budget was designed to support year one of this plan, which starts next school year. The budget priorities shown here were developed as the initiatives for the plan were taking shape, and I will discuss specific priorities and additions to the schools this evening. Key considerations for this year include increasing enrollments at the secondary level, equitable access to necessary support staff for students with disabilities and our English learners, and supporting the capacity of the new high school building and the overall operations of the district. Next slide, please. As you know, one of the many factors we have to consider when we develop a budget is the number of students we have in our schools. Enrollment is one of the main pillars to the long-range plan formula that ultimately funds the town appropriation for the Arlington Public School budget. And this slide presents Arlington Public Schools' current sixth year of actual in-district enrollment from FY18 to 23, as well as several enrollment projection models for FY23 through FY28. And it includes the McKibben projection, um, which we've been tracking right along with. That's the orange line that you see there. Um, that we established back in FY18 and then we've been tracking along with and expect to through FY28. We estimate enrollment using multiple projections precisely because of the multiple factors that impact those projections, including birth rates, real estate trends and sales, vacancy rates, and alternative education options. So the takeaway from this slide and this graph is that despite pandemic fluctuations in enrollment, our enrollment trends have followed the projection from McKibben several years ago and our internal projection continues to provide a strong estimate for future enrollment. Next slide, please. This graph presents the school budget by funding source. The main fu funding source for Arlington Public Schools is, of course, the town's appropriation, which includes uh, the town contribution. The compounded annual growth rate of the town's contribution to APS is 5.16% from FY20 to FY24. 
Chapter 70 state aid is factored into the formula that calculates the school's appropriation. You'll notice that the Chapter 70 trend in this graph, that line, has a steeper slope because of the Student Opportunity Act's implementation. The compounded annual growth rate of Chapter 70 funding to the Town of Arlington is 7.55% from FY20 to FY24. Next slide, please. This chart shares the funding sources that make up the budget on the left. Notably, the town appropriation is the biggest portion of that. Um, and on the right, there's a chart of budgeted expenditures by budget transfer category, elementary education, secondary education, and special education, taking up the greater part of that, administration, curriculum and instruction, grants, and other taking up the rest. Next slide, please. This table shows the overall changes in funding that are coming from all of our sources, including grants, special revenue, and revolving circuit breaker and COVID-related grants from FY23, last year's budget, to this year's budget, FY24, with an overall increase of $4.9 million to the school's budgets, or 5.37% when you consider all of those funding sources for FY24. Next slide, please. What you'll see here is a breakdown of the core financial commitments. This is how we go about our budget planning and think about what it is we want to add in terms of services to the schools. So as our three pandemic funds are added to the total amount from the town appropriation, and our FY23 commitments are then reduced, assuming that those were to stay in place. The FY24 budget increase with ESSER included is about $5.4 million. Then we account for the operational commitments that are essential to the functioning of the system. Specifically, the major commitments that we know come right off the top. They don't allow us to add any services. We just have to have them in order to continue our commitments. So, for example, our contractual obligations and COLA increases for staff, our out-of-district tuition for those students who require out-of-district placements. That's projected to increase at 14% rate in FY24 across all of the different schools that we might send students to. Increases to utilities as a result of inflation and shifting energy usage and adjustments to the budgets of departments that are also impacted by inflation and the rising cost of instructional materials. Finally, we add back budget efficiencies, which I'll discuss in a moment, and we're left with approximately 2.8 million to fund this year's strategic additions to the school budget. Next slide, please. Okay. I want to explain a bit more about what I mean when I say efficiencies. In this year's proposed budget, as well as in last year's FY23 budget, we've taken great efforts to interrogate the services we have in place uh, and, where possible, identify efficiencies or cuts that will allow us to move forward on those strategic initiatives. In an effort to transform the system in accordance with the goals of the strategic plan, we're trying not to simply add on, but to adjust our practice and stop doing things we know either aren't working for students or are no longer needed. This year's efficiencies are listed on this slide. We're working to have more professionally licensed staff, like math interventionists in our schools, to work with our students. And so we have added uh, licensed math interventionists, for example, and eliminated paraprofessionals in order to offset that cost. We're repurposing roles to allow for new roles to enter the system and repurposing positions that are vacant, not for lack of need for the services that those would have filled, but due to challenges in the labor market. So you'll see here over 14 of those in order to allow for staff that will provide stronger services to our students in areas that we are able to staff um, and in areas where it's most needed. Next slide, please. Finally, I'd like to provide a summary of our additions. At the high school and middle schools, we'll be supporting classroom teachers to address increasing secondary enrollments. Our big enrollment bubbles moved through the, middle, the elementary schools and are now headed towards and into the middle schools. We have our largest class at the Gibbs School that we've had since it's opened, uh, and we are anticipating an even bigger class in a couple of years. At the high school, we'll be providing additional staff to support the facilities in the new building. The new building has beautiful new facilities, such as the new auditorium, that require maintenance and require people with technical expertise in order to uh, staff those spaces, particularly in off hours, so that we can do things like rent those spaces to the community and have them be widely used. At the elementary level, we're supporting additional librarians, which we've been working on for years, music teachers to support increased enrollment in fine arts, and support for English learners and students with disabilities. And finally, I only have 20 more seconds. At the district level, we're expanding our business payroll facilities offices, opening up a family welcome center, and increasing district-wide communication support. And I'm deeply grateful to all of you for your service to our community and our children and the time and attention you've given to this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Holman. I had flashbacks to the property transfer article. Um, let's see, we'll take uh, Ms. Waxman first. Pass. Uh, Ms. Farrell. Pass. 
Mm, uh, uh, Ms. Friedman. What was there a pass item here? Uh, Beth Ann Friedman, Precinct 15. And um, let me get this open again. I think a couple of numbers were transposed on, on the budget um, in that on uh, section C and D, it looks like on year 2023, there's a over $1.1 million decrease in funding, and then it goes up. Um, the, oh, page B11. Which, uh, which? So um, this is budget 22 education, section C and D. I think a couple of the numbers were transposed. Could um, someone please address that? Yes, thank you for your question. Um, Michael uh, Mason. Uh, yeah, name and, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm gonna answer. Oh, no, just introduce yourself, that's all. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Michael Mason, Assistant Superintendent uh, for Finance and Operations for the Schools. Yes, that is indeed true. Um, after um, being made aware that the FY23 figure has been transposed, the FY24 figures are actually indeed correct. Thank you. Okay, let's take Mr. Marr next from the uh, satellite room. Yes, uh, Mr. Monterey, John Marr, Precinct 14. Uh, over the past few years, it's become evident, and I've asked the same question uh, a few times, and that it was, how do we stand comparable communities as far as our average teacher salaries go? Because obviously, to maintain the high quality for which Arlington is known for its educational system, we have to maintain, keep our uh, our, our teachers on board. And it's my memory that uh, we have lagged behind fairly substantially with regard to comparable communities on what we pay our teachers. And we've been told in the past that there were plans to catch them up. I wonder what the status of that is now. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hellman, can, can you speak to the competitiveness of salaries of teachers relative to comparable communities? Certainly. This is something we have been working on, and we use the Town Manager 12 averages to help us with this. Uh, right now, where we are is that we have made significant progress as uh, one of the promises to the community as part of the last override. We said we were going to work on teacher compensation and making it more competitive. We've been doing that. Um, so we've increased salaries uh, at a significant rate over the past several years, but we still are lagging behind. Uh, our goal as part of the strategic plan is to get us um, – into a competitive range. So we're using the averages to say we'd like to be around the 60th percentile, and we would like to take a sort of a measured approach to that over multiple years of negotiations um, and make sure that as part of this strategic plan, we get there so that we are competitive with our town manager 12 peers, um, and that will help with retention, that will help with uh, recruitment, and it will also help us to make sure that our staff reflect the diversity of our student body. Thank you. Great, thank you. I don't think we've heard from Mr. Tosti in a while, so let's take you out of order if you want to speak next. Uh, how about Mr. Slotnick? I don't know if he's spoken yet. Um, Mr. Hickman? Mr. Hickman, do you want to speak? Okay. Uh, let's see. We'll take uh, Mr. Moore. Christopher Moore, Precinct 14, motion to terminate debate on the school budget. Uh, motion to terminate debate. We have a second. Um, all those in favor of terminating debate on the education budget, say yes. Yes. All those opposed? No. I'd say that's uh, terminated with a two-thirds vote. Uh, let's move on to the retirement budget, number 25. So let's, let's clear the speaking queue and start that over. Okay. Are we taking requests now? Okay. 
Mr. Jameson, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. Um, it always bothers me that we don't get a report on $15 million of spending. And so I've contacted, I, I talked to the town manager about how to, how to do this. And in, in your fi big financial plan, the big book, used to be the big book, that's online that the manager puts out, there's a very nice page on the, on the financial situation of the OPEB fund and how it's managed. And what I've proposed is, with some embellishments, that the manager's office work with the um, uh, Arlington Retirement Board to compose something similar to that that can be put into the financial plan every year that gives us an update on where we are in the long track towards trying to get our pension plan fully funded. Um, I think the manager is amenable to that. Can he nod? Oh. The manager nods. Thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak to the retirement budget? Seeing none, let's move on to the reserve, uh, the reserve fund, uh, but, uh, number 27. Does anyone wish to speak to that? Is the queue open still? Okay. okay, seeing none, moving on to uh, item A, water and sewer enterprise fund. Mr. Jameson, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. So um, for big of history, men, men, most of you probably know, but men, maybe some of those at home don't, that a large, a large section of your water bill used to be in your taxes. And over the last three years, that part of the tax bill has been removed and that part of the, the debt service that helps pay, pay the, um, our water bill costs has been moved into the water rates. That's why your rates, for the most part, have increased. So previously, our water was artificially cheap. And now our water is full price. And my question, I believe, to Mr. Rademacher would be, have we seen that impact um, conservation in the town? Uh, Mr. Rademacher, do you have an answer to that question? Uh, Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I think it's a little too soon yet to, to determine how that will impact uh, consumption. There are so many factors, uh, wet summer or dry summer or whatnot, uh, impact um, consumption or people's use. So it, it'll be a few years before we determine. But, but if it were to, how would that impact our overall water costs? I'm sorry. The, what? Well, so, so if I understand it correctly, if we were to conserve at a rate higher than other towns and municipality, our water supply costs would go down, our sewer costs would probably go down, and our portion of the debt service would also go down. So e even though the cost might be going up, the rate of increase might, might, might drop some. So it's a... It gets challenging. Um, when folks conserve and we sell less water, we receive less revenue, and but we still have almost the same bills to pay um, because a lot of that is the MWRE costs and the debt incurred there. So it's counterintuitive, but sometimes rates need to go up when consumption goes, goes down. down. Okay, so yes. it's a, it's a crapshoot. Co correct. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's take Ms. Elliott next. Pass. Uh, Mr. Kepline? Yes. Mark Kepline, Precinct 9. I wanted to answer Mr. Jamison's question. Uh, the reward for conservation is higher water bills, higher rates for your water. So they the dominant factor in uh, water and sewer delivery is the infrastructure costs. So if you conserve water, you know, it, they have to increase the, uh, the rate in order to achieve the same level of income and revenue. So that's your reward for saving water. Thank you. Thank you. 
seeing no more speakers, uh, we are now through debates on the budgets. So let's bring up a vote on the main motion. Okay. And so while we're waiting for that screen to come up, um, this is a majority vote. Vote yes if you, voting isn't open yet, but when the green light comes on, um, you can vote yes to approve the town budgets detailed in Appendix B of the Finance Committee's report. These budgets total $167,755,511. Voting is open. Okay, voting is closed, and it passes. Uh, 200 in the affirmative, eight in the negative, four abstentions. Okay, so that brings us to Article 38. Uh, Mr. Yantar, Dr. Yantar, I'm sorry. And uh, did, did you need additional time, or? No, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Hi, everyone. I hope you, are, you and yours are well. Please pull up the capital planning pre presentation. All right, I'm Timur Kaya Yantar, 58 Bates Road, Capital Planning Committee Chair, speaking on Article 38, the capital budget. Uh, just, just one quick interruption. The uh, speaker queue is open. I can see it here. Go ahead. Next slide, please. Okay, this evening I'm going to cover the five points shown here. Next slide, please. First, thank you. The capital plan is a group effort. Many thanks to our partners throughout the town. Mostly this is months of hard work by the capital planning committee. I've listed our members for you here. We're a combination of citizen appointees and town and school officials. If you're interested in our work, we invite you to attend our meetings, which are public. We also post notices from time to time, asking for applicants when there are vacancies. I especially want to call out the work of three people. Much gratitude to our new Deputy Town Manager and Finance Director, Alex McGee, to Vice Chair Christopher Moore, and Town Budget Director, Julie Wayman, for their invaluable contributions of data, organization, writing, edi editing, and production for the report to town meeting. This, <laughs> I couldn't have done it without you. So thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, second, the content of the report. It has an orange cover, as you just saw. Uh, easy, to, if you're getting lost in the woods, you can find your, people can find you. I hope you've had a chance to read it. We lead off with an explanation of what you're voting on, and then that vote itself. This is the capital budget for fiscal year 2024. It starts on July 1st and runs through June 3rd, uh, 30th, 2024 shown on pages one through six of the report. It lists what capital items we'll buy in that year, what we'll pay in debt service, more detail on that in a moment. The report also uh, talks about the full five-year plan with detail by department. It covers both fiscal 24, which is the only part that you're voting on tonight, and the projections for the out years. In the appendix of the report, we have several tables covering all the capital plan items. Next slide, please. Third, our fiscal 24 acquisitions, which total $13.3 million, they're paid for by a combination of cash from general tax, other funds, and bonds. They're listed in sections two, four, and five of Article 38. We discussed this in the report, but here are the highlights. 61% of the capital budget is going to public works, mainly water and sewer maintenance and rehabilitation, also roadways and sidewalk repairs and improvements, and vehicle re replacements. 28% more goes for schools, including information technology for education. So that covers facility repairs, academic IT, and vehicle replacements. Another 10% goes for town buildings. 
Then 8% goes to community safety, that's fire and police. That sum is about half vehicles. In fact, about a third of the total for that is going for a replacement ambulance. The remainder of the budget, about $1 million, goes to capital needs for libraries, other town IT, recreation, and all other departments. And the portion that we finance through bonds in Section 5 comes to $3.7 million in total. I highlight these because they obligate future town meetings to pay their debt service. Next slide, please. This is a good segue to item number four, debt service. For fiscal 24, it's $19.2 million. This is in Article 38, Section 3. It's mostly paid by cash from general tax. It covers principal and interest on all of the bonds that the town has issued in the past. With a few exceptions, our debt is called non-exempt. That is, it fits in the capital plan that's approved by town meeting. Exempt debt is outside the capital plan authorized by townwide debt exclusion referenda. These are usually big ticket items. The clearest example currently is Arlington High School. We have to pay interest on both non-exempt and exempt debt, and here's where we do it. Next slide, please. Okay, apart from debt exclusions, though, the town keeps within the capital plan, and that's my fifth point. Its size in fiscal 24 is $9.5 million. You see it in this table shown here, which is also in your reports on page 14. The 5% rule limits the capital budget to no more than 5% of the town budget. We target that level in both fiscal 24 and for the full five-year plan. The green boxes show that we have hit both of our targets in this plan. This rule constrains the town to live within its means. In order to make room for some new high priority item, something else has to give. Next slide, please. And to conclude, I hope you've had the chance to read the full report. The committee and I are available to take questions. Please vote yes on 38 and please stay safe. Thank you all very much for your time and attention. That concludes the Capital Planning Committee's presentation to town meeting. Great, thank you. Before I uh, take speakers from the queue, I do want to invite up uh, Ms. Garber, who has an amendment to introduce that. And can we, uh, can we switch the display over to that? Judith Garber, Precinct 4. Um, this amendment adds a $15,000 cut to the budget at the direction of the town manager. Town meeting cannot require the town manager to spend or not spend on a specific item in a budget article, which is why the amendment is worded the way that it is. But the intention of the amendment is that the town manager apply this cut toward removing the $15,000 expenditure for BOLA wrap for the police department from Section 2 of the capital planning budget. I have corresponded with the chair of the Capital Planning Committee and with Chief Flaherty on this issue. I don't believe that their decision to purchase these bowler wrap devices were made lightly or hastily, but I also don't believe that the town has received enough community input or has had enough discussion on this decision from residents in town who will be the most impacted. The bowler wrap is a handheld lasso device that discharges a Kevlar tether with a four-pronged metal hooks. Propelled by gunpowder, the tether ejects at 513 feet per second and entangles a target at a range of 10 to 25 feet. The device is marketed as a nonviolent way to de-escalate situations, but it is not entirely safe. The hooks can puncture skin, people can be injured if they fall when tied, and if misfired, the cord could become wrapped around someone's neck. The wrap is meant for police to use on people who are, to use the manufacturer's wording, non-compliant, emotionally disturbed or mentally ill. Unfortunately, a recent town survey found that people with mental health challenges in town have low levels of trust in the Arlington Police Department when they're having an emergency. I worry that adding a potentially painful device will further erode this trust. Our officers work tirelessly to keep us safe and I have great respect for what they do. I believe the best way to make their job safer and easier is to build trust with us, the community, and the best way to do so is through a transparent and accountable process. Please join me in voting for this amendment so we can have that process and discussion on the need for BOLA wraps. 
I also want to make a clarification to the comment in my amendment. Um, it was not the Arlington Human Rights Commission as a body that had concerns. It was individual members of the Human Rights Commission. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, in my correspondence with the chief, uh, I asked about the necessity for these bull wraps. And uh, she mentioned some of the recent incidents that have happened uh, within the towns neighboring us. Um, one 20-year-old young man who was in a mental health crisis was tragically shot by Cambridge police and he died. Um, this is obviously a terrible tragedy, but I don't, I've attended several events with members of the community mourning this death. No one has asked for these bull wraps. Nobody, that is not what they want. They want more mental health clinicians, and I'm very happy to hear from the chief that this is exactly what they're planning on uh, adding, and I would love to add this $15,000 to that instead of this device. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, again, before we go to the speaker queue, I do want to give uh, Mr. Pooler or Chief Flaherty an opportunity to explain because of the nature of the amendment, there's the, clearly the, the intention of the, the amendment, which is focused on the BOLA wraps, but because of the limitations of amendments to the capital budget, uh, it's still at the direction of the, of the town manager uh, who can choose to delegate the decision to Chief Flaherty. So I'll, I'll defer to either of you to, to discuss how, if this amendment passes, what would that mean for the department? Mr. Pooler. Thank you, Sandy Pooler, town manager. Uh, yes, the budget is a bottom line budget. Uh, I forget what the total is. Sorry, Timur. Um, so uh, we could go ahead and still buy polo reps if uh, we wanted to. Um, I would defer to the police chief to talk about her decision about wanting to get this. So. If the chief is available to speak to this, I would ask her to come up, or, or, or Mr. or Timur, if you wanted to speak. Timur Kaya Yantar, Capital Planning Chair. Uh, just to say briefly that when we saw this as an option uh, proposed by the chief uh, in her request, uh, the Capital Planning Committee was. Uh, quite in favor of it. In fact, we suggested that she accelerate the timing of the purchase from one of the out years to FY24. We saw it as being a, a, a helpful um, step in between um, somebody trying to speak to a, uh, an offender of whatever nature um, and get them to stand down or something at the, at the far end of the spectrum uh, having to discharge a firearm in, in, at the person. There are, there's a continuum that you want to be able to um, de-escalate within, and we thought that, saw this as being an intermediate step that could immobilize an offender without um, having to escalate beyond that. Uh, so we were heavily in favor of this. Uh, I'd like to give it over to the chief. If, uh, through, through the moderator, I'd like to ask that the chief, the chief Fla uh, Flaherty um, speak more to the um, use of this uh, device. Uh, they've been piloting it over at, a at APD already. Uh, yeah, is Chief Flaherty here? Yep. Actually, and before we take Chief Flaherty, I, I, we didn't actually move the, the amendment. Um, so just to make sure that we get this in scope, uh, Ms. Garber, sorry, I, I should have asked before you sat down. Uh, can you just make the motion and then we'll make that official? We have a motion to amend the capital budget according to the, what we were seeing on the screen right here. Uh, do we have any seconds? Okay, we have a second. Okay. Chief Flaherty? Uh, yes, Ms. Stamps? Yeah, I think uh, uh, Chief Flaherty, I think, could do that, yeah. Uh, that's not a point of order, but I think Chief Flaherty will get to this. Yeah. Julie Flaherty, Chief of Police. Um, thank you. So a bolo wrap is a de-escalation tool for people who um, are non-compliant and it is basically used for non-life-threatening situations where people don't have firearms. Um, and it involves people who are in behavioral health cr crisis um, or are under the influence of a substance. What it is is um, a, it's a device the size of a remote control um, and Ms. Garber described it. Um, it ejects a, a cord um, that is pointed at someone's feet or somebody's arms um, to resolve situations where people are non-compliant, where people are in crisis. Um, we don't carry tasers in Arlington. That is a pain-compliant tool. This is a non-pain-compliant tool. 
Um, bolo wrap is safer than tasers, then it's safer than beanbag rounds, and it's safer than batons. So over the past year, my team and I have done extensive research. We have attended demonstrations. I have been wrapped myself. Um, there is no pain to it. Um, uh, many members of my team have been wrapped, and um, in my correspondence with Ms. Gaber, I did talk about several incidents that have occurred over the past year. In January of 2022, um, the Burlington police were involved in a situation where they um, shot a person who was in a crisis. Um, their um, de-escalation, their verbal de-escalation tools did not work. The same um, type of incident happened in Lexington in February of 2022, and then again in Cambridge in 2023. Now, I'm, I'm no expert on these cases whatsoever, but I do believe if those officers had um, the proper de-escalation tools, it would have been a different outcome um, in all of those situations. So, um, you know, I'm happy to take any, any questions, but that's basically what, what it is and why we're asking um, for, for funds for this this tool. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take, now we'll go to the speaker queue and we'll take Ms. Ford Weems. Ms. Ford Weems, was there a pass? I couldn't hear. Pass. Okay. Uh, Ms. Culverhouse? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Ms. Henkin. Said, uh, Ms. Henkin, I didn't see that. Go ahead. Ms. Henkin? It's Dr. Hankin now, actually, Precinct 6. Um, I've spent the last couple days looking into these bowler apps, um, and they are pretty intense things. They have barbed hooks at the end. I found a video from a San Jose news broadcast where the news anchor where the news anchor had a bowler wrap tested on him by a demonstrator from their police department. It penetrated his jeans and his thigh was gouged by the hooks. Um, so this is something that can get through your clothes. It can gouge your skin. It can result in stitches. Um, but even more than that, if it's not shot properly, it can and this is from the manufacturer, if it's from above your elbows, it can wrap around your throat, it can strangle you, it can knock out an eye. If someone is deemed to be non-compliant because they are acting strangely because of something like a stroke or a bad reaction to a medication, this could be used on them, they could fall, they could be hurt. This, I understand deeply the need to find something, anything that feels like it can help bridge that gap in de-escalation. And I know from reading that this company very aggressively targets police departments that desperately want to be doing better. But I don't think this is the right option for Arlington. As someone with a disability that results in cervical instability, if I were hit with one of these, I could possibly become a paraplegic. And I don't wanna see that happen to anyone here. No one in our community should have to feel like if something just goes a little bit wrong, they might be hogtied like cattle. We're human beings. This is deeply dehumanizing. Uh, advocacy groups for the deaf, especially, are opposed to these bowler wraps. Um, the uh, helping educate to advance the rights of deaf communities or heard has strongly advised against using these. They're often uh, talked about being used against those who are deaf or hard of hearing because they cannot comply with um, instructions from police. I really appreciate that Chief Flaherty wants to find ways to de-escalate, but the answer is not gonna be some new tech toy. It's going to be in the bonds that we build between the community and the police in Arlington. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take Ms. Culverhouse next.
And just a reminder, the, the, the entirety of our, uh, Article 38 is in scope for debate. Uh, we, we can continue to discuss the bill of wraps. I'm just reminding folks that we're not just discussing the amendment. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Lynette, call the House, Precinct 11. Um, as uh, someone who spent uh, many years in her career working with children with uh, mental health disabilities and uh, uh, developmental delays, and also a large part of my life working with adults with addiction issues and alcohol problems, I have to say that this is the last thing that will provide them the emotional safe space that they need in order to de-escalate. This is not something that will help people in crisis, in mental health crisis, de-escalate. It will only further escalate the trauma that they've, whatever trauma they're going through and the fear that they have. The way to de-escalate is to create a safe emotional space with someone qualified to speak to them and engage with them and connect with them and help them to come down. As a person myself who has been through her own mental health crises, I can guarantee you that I, I had a lasso flung at me by a person in a uniform, particularly a male person in a uniform, I would freak out. And I'm sure many of you would also. This is something that should be used on cattle or animals, but not on human beings. And I urge you to support this amendment and vote it out of the budget. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's take uh, Ms. McKinnon next. We haven't heard from her tonight. Thank you, Sarah McKinnon, Precinct 20. I'm also coming to speak about the bowl of wraps. Um, if, sorry, if there's any question in anyone's mind as to what this device looks like, it does look like quite a small, harmless device. It's about this big. It's a brightly colored plastic. Inside are two long tethering ropes, strings. When it's shot, they spring out of this device from quite a distance. These two springs have hooks on the end. If you imagine a fishing hook with four hooks on each of these wires, they come out, they're supposed to attach to the fabric of clothing on the person and wrap around them very quickly and hold them still. They're supposed to be used below the elbow for safety. They're very loud. The way that I read and saw the videos on their promotional website, it's described as as loud as a gunshot. This is not sounding like de-escalation that I would like to see in Arlington. I think if, that, if we are concerned about supporting police officers when they respond to people in the community who are in distress, who are confused. This is maybe not how we want to meet them and support them. I think there is a lot of enthusiasm for more social workers in this room and in the community. I think this is money that could go towards supporting perhaps training for police officers and perhaps other ways that we can all think together to help keep our community safe and individual members in our community safe. I'm very concerned if this is ever used on a person who isn't in long pants and long shirt. I'm very concerned for people who don't have eye protection. I'm very concerned for people who are moving. When you look at the um, videos on the promotional website, all of the individuals that are the demonstrations, not all, most, are not moving. And the reporting that's come back so far is that it's incredibly difficult to use these devices on anyone who is moving. I don't feel confident in this technology. I don't feel confident from what I've seen from other police departments. The LAPD did a six month pilot study to determine if this was a good idea. 
they decided to use them. They used them nine times. Of the nine times, eight times it was ineffectively deployed. They used other methods of de-escalation to sit to, I don't know what the term is, but to incapacitate and bring someone in. I think we can do better, certainly for $15,000. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jameson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jamerson, Precinct 12. Um, if I read the report correctly, um, is the full cost of the high school now on the tax rate? Uh, let's see, do we have someone who could answer? But Mr. Puller? Sandy Puller, Town Manager. Uh, we still have more borrowing to do on okay. the high school. So uh, at this point, no, uh, there's still about, um, off the top uh, of my uh, head, about $12 million I think we still need to buy. Oh, so most of it's on? Yes. Okay, thank you. That's what I thought I read, um, which, is, which is a good thing. Um, I have a couple questions um, on community safety. So we have a, a mechanical system replacement at Park Circle, which we built relatively recently, and we have a cooling tower on the police services building, which we renovated. Did we not take, well, why are we doing that so soon? Can someone speak to that? Uh, Dr. Yantar, do you want to speak to that? Sure. Timur Kaya Yantar, Chair, Capital Planning Committee. Um, so they're separate. The, uh, you're referring. Page, to, page 24. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I or referring in the uh, vote, it's uh, the me mechanical system replacement uh, at Park Circle, uh, the first item under item under Section 4. So, yeah, that was rebuilt um, approximately... 2005 or something. Yeah, about approximately, not quite 20 years ago, and it is due for uh, replacement, and the uh, facilities department estimated a, t a 10 year lifespan, it, it has exceeded that, okay. and it would uh, probably go for another 10, 15 years afterward. As for the cooling tower, that was not replaced as part of the 2017 renovation of the police station. Okay. And, it has, and it has insufficient uh, ability to cool the building currently. Okay, next question is, um, there's three entries for the central school and community center, which I believe are the same thing. There's envelope repairs, an air handler and an elevator. I thought we just fixed the community center. So the envelope was not fixed. It was not part of the scope of the, okay. of the rebuild. And so that's a study to look into the cost of doing the envelope work. The elevator was also not done during the renovation and it's past its 20 year life. And the third item was? Air handler. Uh, that is uh, being replaced with uh, ARPA funds. Okay, and um, next, um, in the discussion of the new DPW building, somewhere I read that um, because the, the trucks will now be stored indoors and there's a wash station, that we can anticipate that the longevity of our trucks will increase. I just hope that the Capital Planning Committee looks at every truck that is requested going forward mm -hmm. and, and tries to determine whether we are getting that return on investment of the, the enhanced longevity of those that equipment, which could be quite expensive, some of them. It's a significant portion of the DPW budget, so yes, we're looking forward to that uh, savings over time. And my last question is the Bishop School roof. The, the school was done, I think, in 2002, and it's a $1.8 million roof. Yeah, so we began our plan of rebuilding our elementary schools a little over 20 years ago, and so the first few schools that were done are out of their teenage years, and even with maintenance, roofs do wear out. So 20 years is, life, is lifespan, and we are now replacing roofs, and they're expensive. And is that a slate roof or a, a um, shingle? I'm afraid I don't remember that. Okay. Mr. Barron, do you remember? Oh, it's a flat roof. Wow. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Flat roof, said Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett said it, 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 it's a flat roof. 
Well, we'll take uh, Mix Pretzer next from the satellite room. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, David Pretzer, Precinct 17. Uh, I rise to encourage you to vote in favor of the amendment. I appreciate that the Capital Planning uh, Committee and the Police Department uh, would like to um, build trust between the, the Police Department and the community, but this is not the right way to do it. When I talk to people in my precinct and around town, uh, many people are uh, distrustful of the police department, reluctant to call the police department in an incident due to fears that the police uh, department will escalate the situation uh, if they are called. Um, and we've seen time and time again that these so-called less lethal weapons uh, do not help de-escalate mental health crises and, or incidents they tend to escalate it. Uh, and you know, just you need to be realistic. These are weapons. They are you know, less lethal, but they can still be quite painful as someone who's you know, managed to hook uh, themselves with a fish hook. You know, this could be painful, and the manufacturer says that if used improperly, if used against a moving target, uh, if used above the elbows, this can be quite dangerous. We do, we do not want to introduce new weapons that might you know, strangle someone or exacerbate a crisis to build trust between uh, the, the police and citizens. We need to be using uh, unarmed responders for mental health crises, not adding additional weapons that have new failure modes that um, will cause uh, new reasons to be for, for residents of Arlington to be reluctant to call the police during a crisis. So I, I encourage everyone to vote in favor of the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take Mr. Newton next. Sanjay Newton, Precinct 10. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I have a question. The items in Section 2 are a suggestion for the town um, manager? In, in Section 2 of the vote, um, it was mentioned, right, we can't cut a specific line item. Are, are the list of items that the Capital Planning Committee has listed there are a suggestion? Is that what I should take away from that? Uh, Mr. Puller? Sandy Puller, town manager, they're good ideas. <laughs> no. um, and I would direct spending on those ideas. Um, there would be flexibility sometimes. A, project comes in a little un under budget, some, meaning and something else comes in a little over budget, we can move money among those different categories. Uh, but what we do when we spend on capital from this vote is we spend on the items listed there. In other words, we don't spend on other things. So uh, they are, they define categories of things on which we can spend uh, by reducing it by $15,000, uh, we would then have to really deal with what are we going to do about bolo reps or what are we going to do with the tools that we give the police department. Uh, no, and I, if, if I could just finish that thought. Right now the police department has several tools. They have batons, they have guns, they have other things. They also try very much to de-escalate uh, and so, oh. if I have to make a decision about spending, I'm going to have to make a decision about what tools to give the police department. Um, and uh, I, I still may have to decide to go ahead and spend money on this. That's, that's my, my, my overall question, perhaps maybe for Mr. Heim, is we don't get to decide these actual things that are here. We being town meeting? We being town meeting. Yeah. Doug Heim, town council. Correct. So you have a that, series of items. Okay. Yep. That's all. Correct. That's all. Yep. Um, okay. Um, I have one follow-up question for perhaps Chief Flaherty. How much time will officers spend training on the bull wraps? Chief Flaherty? Julie Flaherty, Chief of Police, the training, recommended training is a four-hour training, um, and we would train annually. 
Thank you. Um, so I think that this time, police department time and our money could be better spent. Um, I will be voting for the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fosca, do you have a point of order? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ms. LaCourt. In section, oh, Annie LaCourt, Precinct 13. Um, in section four of the vote, that various capital projects and equipment purchases shown below shall be undertaken and financed by grants or other funds as shown below. Um, I am not able to trace what all grants are supporting this $5,680,000. Is it possible to get a rough idea? I can tell what's ARPA and what's CDBG, but I am unclear about how the others are funded. Um, I mean, I, obviously I know where the rehabilitation for sewers and water come from. Talk to Yantar. Okay. All right, so we're on page five of the report under item number four, Timor Kai yes. Yantar, Capital Planning Chair. Uh, items one, two, three, and four are ARPA, five is Cemetery Fund, six is Chapter 90, that's the state grant, uh, seven is CDBG, as you can see, uh, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 are water and sewer funds, uh, 13, 14, 15, 16 are ARPA, 17 is a grant, 18 is the Parking Benefits District. ARPA, by the way, is the Federal American Rescue Plan Act that is giving uh, Arlington on the order of $35 million, a portion of which goes to capital. And the Big Belly Solar is a? That was, again, the Parking Benefits District is parking paying for item district. number 18. Okay. Um, thank you. That was impressive. <laughs> okay. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, we'll take uh, Mr. Wagner. I stay up till 2 a.m., so I have plenty of time. Thank you, Mr. Moderator Carl Wagner, Precinct 15. I move that we terminate debate on the article and all associated matters. Thank you. We have a motion to terminate debate on all matters before the article and a second. Uh, so let's do a quick voice vote. All those in favor of terminating debate on Article 38, uh, say yes. yes. All those opposed, say no. no. Debate is terminated. Uh, let us bring up a vote on uh, the Garber Amendment. Okay. And the, the voting is open. We won't shut it right away because I, I still need to explain or describe what this is. The Garber Amendment is looking to, sh to add a line item uh, to cut $15,000 uh, of item two in uh, section two of the capital budget. Um, and that's all I'll say. And that, that is at the direction of the town manager to determine how to apply that cut. Let's wait a, bit, a little bit longer. The votes are still coming in since I was still describing what we're voting on. This is the Garber Amendment to add a $15,000 cut to Section 2 of the capital budget. If you're in favor of that $15,000 cut, which is at the direction of the town manager, vote yes. If you're against that cut, vote no. Okay, let's close voting. This is a this is a majority vote for the amendment. And the amendment passes. Let's hold our applause. 107 in the affirmative, 85 in the negative, 19 abstentions. Okay, so the main motion is now amended. And so let's bring up the, the uh, a vote on the main motion. Before we open that, though, uh, let me. Do, there's a lot of detail on this, and I'll try to cover it uh, uh, as, as best as I can summarize. This is a two-thirds vote. The main motion as amended, uh, vote yes if you approve of nine items that are enumerated uh, in the uh, capital planning uh, uh, vote language, the first five of which I'll summarize here. The remainder are some additional terms and conditions related to grant applications and unused funds, which you can find in the official vote language. Uh, number one, transfer of $203,815.91 from amounts previously appropriated and borrowed. Number two, appropriate 
roughly $3.9 million for various capital projects and equipment expended under the direction of the town manager. Number three, appropriate roughly $19 million for debt service expanded under the, expended under the direction of the town manager. Number four, authorize that various capital projects and equipment purchases be undertaken and financed by grants or other funds to be expended under the direction of the town manager. And number five, appropriate roughly $3.7 million for extraordinary repairs to public facilities, land acquisition, and the purchase and installation of equipment and incidental costs. Again, this is a two-thirds vote. Uh, let's open voting. Voting is now open. Please check your handsets to make sure that the vote was received in case you were just clicking into the speaker queue. We're voting on the Capital Planning Committee's recommended vote amended by the Garber Amendment. Okay, let's close voting. And the budget passes. Uh, 204 in the affirmative, seven in the negative. Um, and let's see. And do we have any, do we have any motions of, or, I'm sorry, do we have any notices of reconsideration? 37 and 38, okay. Any other notices of reconsideration? I think that's all we had, right, so. Um, okay, one sec. Uh, just, do you have a motion to adjourn? Okay, we have a second. Okay, all those in, all those in favor? Yes. All those opposed? Okay, we are, we are adjourned. On Wednesday, we will take up the special town meeting warrant articles. Aside from reports of committees, there are only two art other articles in that warrant. And once those articles are disposed of and the special town meeting is dissolved, we'll return to the business of the annual town meeting. And Article 9, which was postponed until tonight, will be resumed after the special town meeting is dissolved on Wednesday. As always, please return your handsets to the plastic bins. Return your seats to the upright position. Raise your tray tables. And good night.